All right, so today we're talking about color correcting and color grading um, and lenses. So we'll start with color correcting and color grading. So um, first of all, if, you're, if you are trying to color correct or color grade your own projects, or if you're trying to actually get into it as something, as a career choice or something you wanna do uh, continuously, you definitely wanna check and see if you can get a monitor that shows accurate colors. We talked about monitors in a previous meeting this semester. Um, so you definitely wanna check all those things out, all the details and, and get as accurate a monitor as you can for your budget. Because when you're color grading, you really wanna see the colors exactly as they're gonna appear so that they match as closely to what you have on everyone else's monitors because every monitor will be set up a little bit differently on how it's calibrated. Even if you don't have a monitor that has really accurate colors, you can still try to get it pretty close by trying to calibrate your own monitor. So there are things that you can plug into your computer which allow you to calibrate your monitor automatically or there's a way to do it manually. You'll have to look that up. Um, but definitely consider doing that if you're trying to color grade any kind of commercial work. If you're just doing like YouTube videos and things that you're not really um, worried about how like professional they look, you just want them to look better, then you can just mess with them on your own and don't really need to worry too much about the whole monitor and accurate color thing. But if you're trying to sell it theatrically or, you know, just boost your production value, then you definitely want to make sure you get a good monitor or at least calibrate it or both if you can. Color correcting is more technical. It's whenever you're when you're color correcting, you're balancing your image, you're adjusting the white balance, making sure that it isn't any, uh, isn't tinted towards magenta or green at all. It's uh, white balanced correctly, making sure that the temperature is, is correct as well. So that skin tones and the things match and look like they did when you were on set or when you were out there. Balancing your exposure so that it's not underexposed or overexposed, so that your whites aren't too high, your darks aren't too low, and there's information in all, in all of it. And basically just making your image look more naturally colored and evenly exposed. So color correction will be your first step if you're going to do any kind of color grade. You start with color correcting to get it to look how it did when you're on set, especially if you're shooting in log, raw formats, things like that. They look very washed out, very blurry, unsaturated, and, and I mean, desaturated and, and pretty ugly. And so you have to do a few things to get it to look correct to how it did on set. Color grading is the next step, and it's where you start making artistic, creative choices to the color and exposure to change the look and feel of the shot and scene, even if it starts to be unnatural. You might add a lot of green or blue or red hue into it. Um, or just change the color entirely to something else to make it look sci-fi or supernatural or anything you want to do. So color grading is more of the artistic thing to set the emotion. You might darken the image a bunch to make it seem more somber and sad, or you might brighten it up to make it seem more happy. Where color correcting is just getting it to look natural, getting it to look correct. So if you look at this image right here, the original image they shot in like log or something like that. So there's like not too many colors. It's not too um, saturated. The exposure is pretty even. And then they color correct it where you can see the grass is kind of brownish looking, the trees, um, they're a little yellow. So maybe it's like a fall or something like that. And they kind of exposed it to be really bright. Then when they're color grading it, they brought down the brightness a bit. They added a bunch of blue and green to really enhance those plants and the sky and make it look very different than it did when it was in real life, like when it was color corrected. So they wanted it to look more like the color graded version, but you still wanna go in those steps. So you'll be using multiple different levels of color adjustments to get to that color grade, where the first one will be color correcting and then on top of that, you'll add another one where you'll start messing with it to make the color gray. Color correcting, since it is more technical and you are trying to kind of match it to how it really looked, uh, there is more of like a right and wrong way to do it. 
because you want to try to make it balanced and look real. Whereas color grading, there's not really any right or wrong way to do it. It's stylistic choice. So however you want to do it, um, it's just whatever you think looks good. It doesn't really have, there's no real wrong way to do it. There's ways to sort of make it look a little better and things like that, but it really, that's all subjective. So what looks better to somebody might look better, might look worse to you and vice versa. So with a color correcting workflow, when you're color correcting, the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna correct the exposure. You're going to make sure that you wanna use like a waveform and the waveform from left to right will show you what is on screen, what is in the, what is on, uh, in the image. Let me uh, actually click on this. So from left to right, if we go from left to right on the waveform, we go from left to right on the actual image, we can see the sky is a lot brighter, the water and the rocks are a lot darker. So on the left side of the waveform, there's not as much information up here at the top near the 100 mark, because there's not as many brights. They're more in the mid tones and, and the uh, shadows, because the water is very dark on that side. When we get over here, there's the boat, there's the sky, and then there's some dark rocks in the middle. And so on the waveform, it's showing that there's a lot of information up at the top near the 100. 100 will be your peak whites, your highlights. If they go to 100 or above, they're going to start um, clipping or get overblown, which means that they don't have any information anymore. They're just pure white. And that's something you don't want. So when you're exposing or evenly exposing your image, you wanna bring it down so that nothing is going at or above that 100. If you look like right here, you can see that if there is something that is at 100, it'll start being a flat line. And that means that there's not really going to be any information there. It's going to start just being a, a complete white blob or little circle. So somewhere on the image, somewhere near the, it's probably one of these clouds um, that has that pure white somewhere around here. So if they start darkening it, that white might just look like a darker gray. And so that's something you really want to avoid when you're taking the picture, taking the, um, or shooting the scene. Something the camera person should uh, adjust whenever they're on set. Then you have zero and at zero, it's the same thing, but it's for the blacks. If you bring it to zero or below, you're going to start what's called crushing your blacks, which is going to have that flat line. It's going to appear at the bottom, which means there's going to be no information in the shadows. And even if we have it like, tiny, just a slightly a bit above zero to us, to our naked eye, it might look like there's nothing there. Um, but it is, it is, there's something there that's a little bit different than having it be pure black. So even if you can't really tell that it's there, there is some information there and you'll notice, you would notice if it was completely black or if it had that tiny bit of uh, information in the shadow. It's just a little harder. To, you can't really tell unless you like pay attention and, and look at it side by side comparison. But if the film or the picture had a bunch of overblown whites and um, crushed blacks, you would see that it uh, doesn't look very good. So when you're correcting for the exposure, what they try to do, a lot of people will try to um, bring the darks, the shadows close to that zero, slightly above it, but not too far down to where it starts crushing them and making them have no information. And they will bring the highlights up so that it is near and doesn't go to or above the 100 mark to make those whites be overblown. And having a, a, having a big amount of information like this going from top to bottom from zero to 100 has a lot of dynamic range in the exposure. There's a lot of difference between how bright parts of the image are to how dark parts of the image are. So it depends on what you're taking the picture of some pictures or images or, or scenes will have a lot less light. So they won't be having as much information in the highlights, in the highlight area. Um, and some will have a lot more, it'll be way more bright, a complete white room or something like that. Or you wanna make it look like afterlife or heaven or whatever. So you might not have too many darks in your scene and that would have more information up in the top 
near the 180s, 70s, 60s area, rather than having a bunch of information down at the bottom near tens and zeros. But if you have a scene or a picture like the one we're seeing where there's a bunch of um, dynamic range between the darks and the lights, there's a lot of different exposure levels in this image alone. That's when you want to try to bring your shadows down and your brights, your uh, highlights up. And that will create that dynamic range and that contrast so that it doesn't look as milky or as faded as you will get when you have the, like the original in this, whenever you're shooting in log or raw format. Log and raw, they try to keep as much dynamic range and the exposure levels and the color as possible. And they do that by shooting in that way, but then you have to color correct it and color grade it later in post to get it to look right and look nice. So you have to add some of that exposure um, to get that contrast back. And then you add some saturation and things like that to bring it back into uh, looking natural. After you color, after you correct the exposure, uh, and you can see in this, this one uh, shows like whenever he's brightening up the image, it's raising the entire waveform and it's going above 100 and starting to crush the white or overblow the whites, making them have no information. So in whenever you are messing with exposure levels, you can mess with just the shadows, which is gonna be the darkest parts of your image. You can mess with the mid-tones, which are gonna be somewhere in the middle. And you're gonna mess with the highlights, which are gonna be the brightest parts of your image. Or you can mess with the master like they're doing right now, which is bringing the entire image brightness up or down. And that's why the entire waveform is going up or going down whenever he's moving it. If you're just messing with the shadows, just the bottom part's going to be moving up or down. If you're just messing with the highlights, just the top parts are gonna be moving down or up um, and things like that. So some people, it depends on what you like, but some people like to bring not to have too wide of a waveform. They don't like it to go from zero to 100. They like it to be a little more crushed, a little more in the middle. It really just depends on what you want, what you're shooting and uh, what the scene is. But, um, but yeah, so that's where you start when you're color correcting. It's just correcting the exposure levels to make it have that contrast again. Second thing you do is you're gonna to try to fix your white balance. So let me see if I have a picture. Oh, let me show you this picture. So crushed blacks, if you have crushed blacks, you can see that on the left, the blacks, you can't really see any information in those rocks. Where on the right, you do see some kind of a definition there. You see something there, but in the left, you can't really see anything. It starts to become just like a black blob. There's not really too much in there and it doesn't look as good. So usually you don't wanna to try to crush your blacks too far and you don't wanna to try to overblow your whites. But again, depends on what you're trying to do. When you're color correcting, you typically wanna make sure that it's evenly balanced and that nothing is crushing or being overblown. And then in color grading, if you decide that you want things to be crushed or you want to have overblown whites, that's when you start making those adjustments. So again, it would be, um, another step to it to get it to be looking different. You don't want to do that with the color correction because that's more just technical trying to get it to look correct. Crushing your blacks doesn't look correct, doesn't look realistic, but it's a stylistic choice. Overblowing your whites doesn't look realistic, but it's another stylistic choice. So that'd be more of a color grading thing. Oh, and then there's overblown white. So at the top, you can see that they go above 100. It starts being just a flat line right at the top of that waveform. And those, the water on the rocks, you can't really see any detail in the waves. It just looks like a white blob. Whereas at the bottom, they have it underneath the 100. And so you can see that there's definition, there's detail in that waveform itself from going from left to right as in the image, and you can see that there's some, now we can see the waves, we can see the different colors of the waves within the rocks themselves. They don't just look like a white pool of nothing. They have some, they have some information in there that we can see.
there is this um, Ansel Adams zone system, which kind of shows what he thinks should be in different exposure levels, pretty much. If you're going from total black to total white, he's kind of telling you like at zone zero, which would be all the way to the left at the top, complete black. It's the lack of complete density is total black if you're gonna print your image or your, your shot. Zone one would be the first step above black, so slight tonality, but no texture. Zone two, which again, you can start seeing it gets a little more gray. First suggestion of texture, deep tonality is representing the darkest part of the image in which some detail is required. Zone three, it's a little more gray, a little less dark. Average dark materials, low values showing adequate texture. Zone four, now we're starting to get like into a dark gray, less black. Average dark foliage, dark stone, landscape shadow, zone five. Now we're at middle gray. Dark skin, gray stone, weathered wood, middle gray. Zone six, it's getting a little brighter, starting to get a little more white in that gray. Average Caucasian skin value and sunlight. Shadows on snow, in sunlit snowscapes, light stone, clear north sky. So these are just some like uh, examples of what you might find within that exposure range. It doesn't mean that you have to have these there if you have a Caucasian person or a dark skinned person or snow in, in a shadow. It doesn't mean you have to have it in this zone six, otherwise it doesn't look good. It just means Typically, if you're, if you're looking at it, just going outside and taking a picture and having it natural, this is where this type of stuff will fall in these uh, different exposure levels. So then you have zone seven, now we're getting pretty white, very light skin, light gray subjects, zone eight, white with textures and delicate values, zone nine, glaring white surfaces, snow and flat sunlight, white without texture and zone 10, light sources, actual or reflected, printed at maximum white. And again, that's just a like an example of what you might find in those different zones. People use that as just like a quick um, cheat sheet when they're on set sometimes or they're taking, fo or they're, uh, taking photography, they're uh, taking a photography course or they're just shooting pictures by themselves. They'll just use this as like a quick example to see if they have their exposure set right. And then when they're editing it, they'll try to, when they're color correcting it, they'll try to get those uh, different things in these different zones just to make sure that it looks right. But it's not like a hard and fast rule. All right, so after you're done correcting your exposure, when you are color correcting, the next step of color correcting is fixing your white balance. And you can do that by using something called RGB Parade, which looks like this, which is pretty much just three different waveforms for each color channel in the image. So when we're looking at an image on a computer, the color channels are red, green, and blue. And if these all match or match pretty well, then you have a pretty evenly balanced white balance. If the blue is higher or lower and the green is higher or lower, or the red is higher or lower, that means that the white balance is off. There's more reds or greens or blue in there than, than some of the other stuff. And you might start seeing that in people's skin tones or in the sky and things like that. Um, it also depends on what is in the image. You know, if there's a clear blue sky, then there should be a little bit more blues in some of those mid-tones than there is in greens and reds because blue is in the sky, it's the whole sky. So there should be a little bit more blue. So um, that is why you see like this middle, it's like, uh, I guess, bar of blue. That's kind of like the mid-tones, but they're raised up a little higher just because there's a bit more blue in this image than there is these other colors. So again, this will also depend on what you're, what you're shooting what's in the image. If you're shooting a brick wall, there should be a lot more reds than there are blues and greens, just because of what the way brick looks more red than blue and green. If you're shooting a tree or tree foliage, then uh, it should have more green than blue and, and red, things like that. 
But typically speaking, if you're shooting a person, a subject, or just a scene in general, most of these should, should be around the same, um, should look around the same, like to be even, to be evenly balanced. It's the same way with the um, with the exposure levels. When you're using a waveform, just a general waveform, you have the highlights, the midtones, and the shadows. But when you're looking at the RGB parade and you're, and you're um, adjusting it, you are adjusting the highlights, the midtones, and the shadows for the red channel, the green channel, and the blue channel, which means that to get them all even, you'll have to kind of mess around with all three elements to get them to be exactly the same. Um, the highlights for the blue might be higher than the highlights on the green and the red. And so you might need to bring the highlights only down, not just the whole entire blue channel, just the highlights of the blues. So it'll really depend because blue is in this image, it's in the ocean, so it's in the water. And that's a darker blue, so that'd be more like a mid-tone or an undertone of blue compared to the sky, which is a brighter blue, which will be more in the highlights of the blue channel. As well as you can see like those little buildings in the background, they're very light blue. Those would also maybe be in the highlights. So you really have to like check your image and see what, what is in there and see where the channels should align because different things should be different um, values in each channel. Different shades of blue will be different highlights, shadows, midtones in the blue channel and things like that. So you have to check and see what, what's in your image and then try to match these up accordingly to get the white balance correct. if you're using this tool to get your white balance correct. There's multiple tools you can use to try to get white balance correct. Um, another one is vector scope, which we'll get into in just a second. This is still RGB parade, but you can see like when they're changing the image, it's looking a little more um, red. It's actually raising everything up a bit, but it's raising red more than it is anything else. You can see the bottom of the red, the shadows of the red channel get raised up higher than the blue and the green channel. The green channel gets raised up the least and the blue channel gets raised up just slightly more than the greens. And that's giving that background, if you look at the right, uh, you can see the gray is turning a little bit more magenta. It's looking a little more red because that red channel, the shadows of the red channel are getting raised up. So all the shadows in the image are looking a little more red. So the darkest parts of the TV, the wall, because they're dark gray. Um, if you're raising the shadows of the red channel up on the whole image, then you are going to introduce more red into all the shadows of the image, like the wall, the TV, anything that's dark. And raising one channel doesn't just mean that it's going to affect that one channel because there are some blues and greens in each. So it depends on which way you're moving them uh, will affect the other channels as well, just not to the same extent. So really this is just a tool to see what's happening with the color and the image and um, where, like how much of each, how much blue, how much green and how much red are in this image and, and where they are and like shadows, midtones, and highlights. Once you get more used to looking at it while you're adjusting color, you'll start to see what this is doing and why and how it works a little better than I can explain just from showing you a quick image. But they work the same as a waveform from left to right on the waveform, these blue. Um, there's not as much highlights on this side because on the left side of the image, it's more dark grays. And then you have a lot of information going on in the midtones on the right because you have some white some light gray and a lot more information going on on the right side of the image. You have a little bit of highlights in the middle and that's the cat, but also the ceiling because the ceiling is white. And so you can see from left to right, it's following the same way that this image is from left to right. If you overlaid them over the image, you would see that it's showing you what the darks, lights, and what the uh, shadows, midtones, and highlights look like 
in each part of the image from left to right. Vector scope. It's a video scope that provides greater data about color properties of a video image. It's another thing to check out what, what's happening in the image to see uh, what kind of colors are there. Vectorscope contains markings that indicate the degree of hue and saturation in an image. The further the markings are from the center, the more saturation you have. So we're looking at this thing. You can see on the left side, there's those, the vector scope, it has a, it's a little blurry, so sorry about that, but it has these white lines that are stretching out in each direction. The closer those are to the middle, like if it's just a little circle in the middle, that means that there's not much saturation going on. Um, you can't really tell in this picture, but the top right here is red. Then there's magenta, blue, cyan, green, and yellow to the left. So if the arms are this in this picture, for instance, the arms are stretching a lot more into the blues, which means if we saw this image, there'd probably be a lot more blue than there is anything else. There's also some stretching into the reds, which means there's a lot more reds and blues than there is any green. So nothing's really stretching in that direction. And they're stretching really far over to the blues, which means that the blue is very saturated. The further it is towards the edge of the circle, the more saturation there is of that color in the image. Now, oh, well, I had a clearer picture right here, but there you can kind of see it a little better. When you're talking about people, one way some people will uh, do the white balance if they have a human subject in the image is they will try to align those white, the part of the image they'll um, isolate just the skin They'll make like a mask and just show part of the cheek or part of the hand or some part of the person's skin. And they will try to make sure that, that, um, that the line aligns with this line right here. The line is in between the red and the yellow and it's called the flesh line. The flesh line doesn't matter what skin tone you have. You have darker skin tones, lighter skin tones. Everybody's skin tone falls on this line when it's isolated. So um, when you are trying to get a white balance correct, one way people do it is they try to make sure they um, isolate the skin tone and they adjust the colors until the information falls on that line because that means the skin tone is correct, which means the rest of the scene should look pretty, um, pretty much correct too. If you look at this, you can see no matter what their skin tone is, that the lines are still going on that, in that direction. Like the color information is still falling towards the middle of red and yellow, where the skin with the flesh uh, line is. And so since that's on the line, we can see that, okay, it's pretty much all white balanced correctly because these people look natural. They don't look too dark, too bright or a different color completely than a realistic skin tones look. So that's one way people white balance an image. Um, one second. All right, so one thing I also wanted to mention was that uh, if we're talking about color, we're talking about color with light when we're talking about video. And there's something called primary and secondary colors when you're talking about adjusting things. So if you're doing any kind of color correction or color grading, it's good to know these things. So red, green, and blue are the primary colors. And that's because with light, if you um, mix, let me go to this image. If you mix the two colors, red and green, you're going to get the secondary color, yellow. If you mix blue and, and green, you're going to get that secondary color of cyan. Cyan, I don't know how to say it, but 
And if you mix the blue and red, you're gonna get that secondary color of magenta. If you mix all three together, you get white, white light. And the reason this is important is because whenever you are adjusting colors, you're going to have this color wheel. I don't know where did I go. This color wheel where blue is on one side, you can see, and yellow is on the other side. So if you're taking away from the blue channel, if you're lowering the blue, it's gonna make it look more yellow. If you're taking away from the green channel, it's gonna look more magenta. And if you're taking away from the red channel, it's going to look more cyan. So it'll be a mixture of blue and green. If you take away all three of them, it's just gonna look black. And if you add to all three of them, it's just gonna look white because you are adjusting these colors, making them look different. So if something looks too blue, you know, if it looks too like light blue, cyan, you might wanna add a tiny bit of information to the red channel just to see if that fixes it, if that adjusts it to be looking more correct and vice versa. If something's too red or too magenta, then you wanna to try to um, add something to the green channel or obviously taking away from the red channel. Knowing what color is in the image and knowing what you should change it to can help to make it a quick decision on which what needs to be changed, what needs to be added, or what needs to be taken away so that the color that you're trying to get rid of goes away. And doing that is knowing the color wheel, knowing these colors, knowing what makes what. And so getting used to that, if you are gonna look this up on your own, make sure you're looking it up for light. Color for light is different than um, the other color wheel, which we'll get into next semester, which is talking more about like physical items. Pigment, yeah, that was right, pigment. So if you look at this additive color wheel, you'll see one side you have blue, the other side is yellow. So like I said, taking away from the blue, it's gonna make it look more yellow. One side of it is red, the other side is cyan. So taking away from the red, it's gonna make it look more cyan. And then green, magenta, and all these other colors in between. And you can see what's on the opposite side. So if you take one away or if you add to it, it'll be taking away from this side, this channel, and making it look more like this. Or if you're subtracting some of this side or this side, you'll be moving it more towards the other side of the wheel. And if that sounds confusing, it's a lot easier to understand when you actually start editing it and you start adjusting it in the software itself and you see it happen in real time. Another thing that a lot of um, editors can do now, whenever you are adjusting color, uh, this image itself is from DaVinci Resolve, but you can also do this now in, in Premiere Pro um, Creative Cloud or in Final Cut Pro 10. It allows you to kind of isolate a certain color within the image and you can adjust how much of it it is selecting. So it's kind of like when we looked at green screening, you're trying to select the person to isolate them to, to make them green screen, um, to make the rest of the screen go translucent while keeping the subject um, opaque. This is selecting that person or selecting that color. So he's trying to select her skin tone so that her skin doesn't change color or that only her skin changes color. You can either only change her skin or you can make it to where everything else changes but her skin by selecting what you um, want to adjust. So you, he grabbed part of her skin and he just adjusted the, the strength that it's grabbing, like, you know, cause her skin's not one color. There's a, especially because there's a light on her face on one side. So some parts look a little darker. So you kind of have to make a little adjustments to grab the part of the image that you want, but then you can make it to where you can only adjust a person's skin tone or you adjust the background only. You might wanna adjust a sign and make it a different color, but you don't wanna adjust the rest of the image. Well, now you can just kind of select part of the image, select that color, 
and just tell and then uh, you'll see it kind of shape what it's going to what it's, what it's going to edit like you can see the more he does it's kind of grabbing a few things beyond her face like some things in the background and so what he's actually doing he's making a mask so that it only grabs her face because he only wants to adjust that but if you wanted to you could also just adjust like any of the of the browns or the blacks or the the whites, the pinks, the yellows, whatever color, if you want to change all of that to make it kind of match, you can. And it makes it a, a lot easier, a lot more intuitive to figure out what you want to do and why. And like, you know, you only want to change the background. You may, you may, you want to make it more blue, but you don't want her skin tone to be more blue because you want her to stand out from the rest. Or or you want her to be blue, but you don't want the background to be blue because it's already blue enough. Or you want the background to really shine and her to be hidden in the background. So there's a bunch of different cases you can do this with. Some people do it to kind of match the colors a little better. Like maybe the, the person's wearing orange and they walked by some yellow poles, but they kind of want that to match a little better. So they adjust the poles to look a little more orange or they adjust her jacket to look a little more yellow. That way everything kind of matches a little better and there's you know unlimited amounts of use cases for what you might want to do with that kind of thing where you're isolating a certain part of the image or a certain color within the image that you want to adjust you make somebody look like an alien you can make them look like a different skin tone you can make them uh, look brighter you can only affect their skin to make them glow while everything else around them looks the same all these different kinds of things you can do. So it is very useful and it is pretty much in all of these different editing softwares now, if you have one of the newer ones. Um, the other thing you can do, just like with green screen, like he's doing right there, he's making like a circle or he's making a mask because he only wants to select her face. You can make a shape where that's the only part of the image that you want to be adjusted. But when we're doing video, when we're doing movies and film, things are moving. So you do have to kind of create a mask around the person. A lot of uh, the editing softwares will automatically try to follow somebody's face or follow whatever you're trying to adjust, but it doesn't always work precisely. So sometimes you're gonna have to kind of animate that mask and make it follow the, the movement. Um, but it is still very useful to be able to adjust one thing within the image without doing too much uh, extra work for it like you used to have to do if you were trying to color grade things. When you do start color grading, so color correcting, you're going to grab this, the image that you're working with or the, the scene that you're working with, and you're going to actually adjust the um scene itself you're going to adjust the actual track with the video on it when you're color grading some people say that you you might want to use an what's called an adjustment layer and an adjustment layer will allow you to first of all it allow you to adjust multiple clips at once because maybe you have seven different clips that are shot in the same scene and you want them to kind of match after you color corrected them, you want to color grade them and make everything look more orange and, and a, a little more bright and friendly. You can do an adjustment layer, put that over the top of all the clips, and then put some orange into the adjustment layer so that all of the clips below it receive a little bit of orange hue or orange tint. And that way everything kind of matches at once. You don't have to go individually into each clip and adjust them separately. You might still have to make a few slight adjustments depending on what the lighting looks like and things like that, but it does save a lot of time to be able to just group things together in that way. Another thing you can do with an adjustment layer is you can mess with the opacity to make, if you did an effect, but you made it too red or it just doesn't work for part of a scene, you can adjust it and, and just make the opacity of it a little less so that it's not as, um, so that's more transparent and it, and it kind of blends a little better with the, uh, with the uh, real image. And it allows you to like dial it back a bit later, or just delete the whole thing and start over without having to go into the clip 
and adjust things because you don't want to accidentally get rid of things that you did with the color correction when you're color grading because color grading would be the next step. So basically it's just like making a new layer on top of the, the, um, the actual footage and just adjusting that as if you were green screening and just making a mask. It's pretty much the same concept. Make a new track with the adjustment layer, which is just an invisible thing. You add some kind of color to it or some lighting effects to it, and it's gonna affect the image, the actual bit footage underneath without affecting the actual footage itself. If you are in a different tool, some tools have different names for these um, sh shadows, midtones, and highlights. Shadows is your darkest part of the image. Midtones is the middle. Sometimes people will say undertones. That's kind of in between the midtones and the shadows, somewhere between those two. And then highlights will be the brightest parts of your image. Um, certain applications will call gamma shadow. So you'll have gamma. Pedestal is another name for midtones in certain applications. And gain is another name for highlights. So you might see a color correcting um, or color grading tool that says gamma pedestal gain. And basically that just means gamma is your shadows, pedestal is your midtones, and gain is your highlights. Other things called shadows lift. So if you see lift in color correcting tools, that just means that's your shadows. Or they just call it black and white, black being the darkest of the shadows and white being the brightest of the highlights. So those are just some different names you might come across when you're messing with different tools. I know that um, I know that Premiere Pro's uh, Creative Cloud, the new one, it has what's called, I think it's Lumetri Color. And if you look at the image, it's just on the right, it shows you like the white balance where you can mess with the temperature, or you can make it look more daylight or more tungsten just from using that slider. The tint where you can take away some of the green or magenta by, by using that slider. And then it has the tones with the exposure, the contrast, and it calls it highlights, shadows, whites, blacks, where blacks would be your darkest of your, of your shadows. Whites would be the brightest of your highlights. And then highlights, shadows, saturation, things like that. And I think Lumetri Color actually allows you to isolate certain, certain things in the image as well. So you can pick, if you wanted to like for this image itself, if you wanted to change just the snow, make it look more like grass. You could select it, isolate it, and uh, adjust the, the strength of your selection until it kind of picks the snow that you want, and then maybe make a mask around the rest of it so that it doesn't select the clouds in the sky, and then adjust it to be more green. So it looks more like grass, less like snow, something like that. You can see in this image, he's kind of adjusting a few little things on that on that uh, hue curve or that hue line, where all of the color inside of that, the white light to the right is, is basically the only thing that's getting adjusted for some parts of it. And then some of the building for the other parts are turning a little more blue or a little more gray, depending on what he's doing. One second. So when you're adjusting the saturation of things like this, if you're gonna use that tool on the right, something like that, it actually allows you to take certain parts of the image and adjust just the color that is on that, um, that hue. The hue is basically just the color we see when we're talking about light with color. So if you're if you see a um, 
blue light, if you see a blue color and you go to this tool and you adjust the blue and you bring it over to a different color, you can actually just affect that part of the image and make it um, a new color because that's the part of the image that lies on that, that part of the line. Basically that spectrum of the rainbow. You know, if we're talking about a rainbow, then all the colors we see are on certain spectrums of that rainbow. And in the computer, if we're taking that, that spectrum, if we're taking that thing that looks blue, then we can tell it, no, actually that thing is, is uh, red. And then it's gonna take all the blues in the image and make them red without affecting the rest of the stuff. It might you know, affect some things because everything will have a bit of blue in them. Like that building, it looks a little more brown or red to us. But when he's adjusting the blues, when he's adjusting the greens, it does affect the color of it a little bit. And that's because, you know, the color usually isn't just on one tiny little spectrum. There's usually multiple colors that we see that are, com that are combining to make the color, the final output that we're looking at. So it's a bit, of, it's a little complex, but it's like basically just saying uh, that color of the building, it's not just green, it's not just blue, it's not just red. It's a mixture of all of them. So adjusting one color will adjust the building a little bit, but something that we see that's clearly blue looking to us, uh, that'll be affected way more than the building itself, if that makes sense. Um, one thing you want to keep in mind when you're talking about midtones, highlights, shadows, things like that, skin tones, and most things that we see are going to be in the midtone area. Most things aren't highlights or shadows. Most things are somewhere in the middle. So skin tones and things like that are somewhere in the middle gray. So if you're adjusting midtones, it's going to adjust the majority of the image. If you're adjusting the color of the midtones, it's going to make the whole image a little bit different color looking compared to if you're just adjusting the highlights, the color of the highlights, that would be, you know, maybe the sun or the clouds or whatever the brightest part of the image is, that might change the color of that. Or adjusting the shadows. Adjusting the shadows can also really impact the whole image because there's shadows in any part of an image that we see that doesn't have light is what would be the shadow. So that will affect the color of that. Usually we're used to seeing you know, black or dark gray or something. So when you start adjusting the colors of the shadows, it's very noticeable and starts to get less real looking. So it is more of a stylistic choice, but it does start to uh, affect the image a bit. You can see that actually happening in this when he's, if you look at the soldier, look at that, um, the building or the uh, the alleyway in between the two buildings, and then you look at the bottom. You can see when he's adjusting the colors, those things start looking a different level of black or a level of different colors. A little bit of green looking like it's going in there. Now it looks blue, and then it goes back to white. And those things are getting a little more noticeable than the rest. Even though if you look at the top right, you can see that the the brightest part of the image is getting affected as well. The majority that we're seeing getting affected is the shadows and the midtones. When you're talking about color grading, the uh, with software anyway, DaVinci Resolve has become the industry standard for color grading. However, it is different than any other editors because it works with what's called nodes. You see, I have a picture of yeah. So you see, like the nodes over here on the right. Um, they're basically the same thing as you would get if you were messing with layers. They just work a bit differently. They work from left to right rather than working from top to bottom like you would do in Final Cut or Premiere Pro. And so the first little node affects the rest. If you make adjustments to this first node all the way to the left, it's going to change the way all the rest of the nodes look later down the line. So basically the first step would be like color correction and that would be the one, your first node, starting from the left. And then you'd go to your next node and then you'd make further adjustments. And then you'd go to the next node and you'd make further adjustments. 
if you met to the third node made adjustments and you like the way it starts to look, but you want to go back to the first node and make, you know, change something, it's going to change the way the second and third node look. And it's the same way with Premiere Pro and Final Cut. If you have a layer on top of the image, whatever's on top is going to affect everything underneath it. So if you start from the bottom, you do your color correction and you add an adjustment layer on top of that to add some lighting effects or some coloration, add another adjustment layer on top of that. It's gonna keep making adjustments, but then if you go down to the bottom layer and you adjust things, it's going to change the way all the rest of those look. So just keep that in mind when you're color correcting, color grading. Get to a part where you like. If you're working in DaVinci Resolve, start from the left. And then don't, go, don't really try to go back to the beginning um, because it, it will affect the rest. So uh, just keep that in mind. And if you're in Final Cut Pro or Adobe Premiere Pro or you know, After Effects or something, then start from the bottom and go to the top. Make sure you have it good and then go to the top. I mean, go one layer up, one layer up. Keep making adjustments like that instead of going back to the bottom and making adjustments because that'll affect all of the rest of the work you've done. With DaVinci Resolve, even though it is the industry, industry standard because it does work differently with these nodes and how it works and everything, there is a learning curve. Even if you've done color correcting, color grading, in other applications. So uh, it's, it isn't as easy to, to learn. It's not as intuitive of so, as some of the other ones, especially if you've, video, if you've done any uh, video editing or anything like that, you're, you're a little more used to how the, uh, how, it, how the other applications function when it comes to color correcting and color grading, it just makes more sense. Compared to this one, it still makes sense once you learn it, I've heard, but it just, it, it is a different way of doing things. So it is a bit of a different learning curve. You're not as familiar with it. It's not as familiar and, and you're not as used to it. So there is a learning curve there, even if you've done other softwares before or even color grading on other softwares, but it just has more um, capabilities. It has more things for isolating different different parts of the image, different colors. It's very good at, at registering and, and realizing what kind of colors you are going for to try to adjust. And I've heard that it just has a lot, a multitude more of options than most of the other applications out there. So that is why it is the industry standard being used. But you can still get really good looking images from other applications as well. You just, as long as you know the tools, you know what you're doing, that's the main thing. Um, and once you start learning them, then you can maybe get DaVinci. One good thing about DaVinci is it's free. So if you did want to try out color correcting or color grading, you could download it. It's just going to take time to learn. So you are going to be spending time to learn it, but you won't be spending money to learn the free version. And the free version has a, a multitude of the options. It doesn't have all of them, but it has most of them. So unless you're doing this professionally, most people say you don't really need the full version and you can get by with just the free version on DaVinci Resolve. When we are adjusting color, I already talked about this, a little bit about this. We have, we have what's called HSL, where H stands for hue, S stands for saturation, and L stands for luminance. Hue is the color on that light spectrum. I think it's actually on here, if he'll go back to it. So it's that top, this, the hue is, you know, the rainbow. We see what, what actual color we're seeing, that's the hue. What? Repeat yourself, because that last sentence cut off. I don't know if it was just me or, but just in case. Okay, so hue is basically the spectrum of light that we're seeing. It's that rainbow. Um, it's the, you know, whatever color you say is that, that looks green. Well, it would probably be somewhere on this green area of hue. So that's hue. It's pretty much just the actual color um, when we are talking about it in, in the way we see things. 
Saturation is the strength of that color and its vibrance. A desaturated image will look less colorful and have a duller and plainer look. And like I said earlier, you can also adjust the red, green, and blue saturation separately to have any pop out more or less than the others. And that's where that color wheel comes in. The more you do red and green. Oh, wait. Huh, it's just a layer. Hmm. Um, saturation separately to have it pop out more or more than the rest. So that's where that color wheel comes in because the more you're adjusting the saturation of red and green, the less you're gonna see blue, you know? So just, you'll have to adjust things yourself to see it, but pretty much saturation is just how colorful things look, how cartoony they look, I would say. If you adjust it all the way up, you'll see it look very vibrant, very mystical or magical. Um, and if you adjust it all the way down, it'll look a little more like a noir film. It look like more moody. Yeah, one of those teen angst TV shows. They'll be like more black and white. If you adjust it all the way down, it'll be black and white. If you adjust it all the way up, it'll be ridiculously colorful with different colors, very prominent. So uh, just that's something to think about with that. And luminance adjusts the brightness of the color. And it can also be used to brighten or darken individual red, green, and blue channels. So luminance also affects how we see color. If we see color in the dark, it looks different than if we see that same color in the light. And you can, you can go into a room and you can check that out yourself. You've obviously you've seen it your whole life, so you know what it looks like. A brown thing or a dark blue car might look black when it's nighttime, but in the daytime, you might see that it looks blue. And that's because there's more luminance or less luminance on it. So when we're in the computer and we're telling it how bright or dark something is, it's gonna adjust how it looks, how dark or bright that specific color looks. There are also plugins that you can get with many of the softwares to adjust certain things and make it a bit easier and more intuitive. I've heard Cinecolor, I think it's Cinecolor, is a, is a pretty good one. And there's other ones out there for different applications for Premiere Pro, Final Cut, even DaVinci Resolve, all of them can get different plugins that have more specified tools or just more clearly instructed tools in what they do. So you can, you can uh, look at those. Most of them cost money, so it'll be an extra expense. But if you're trying to do this a lot, usually it's worth it depending on what you're trying to go for because it's just like a, a quicker way of getting there without having to manually do all the work. One of the most often used plugins are what's called LUTs or lookup tables. They're basically presets for color grades and color corrections. So many people will start their color correcting or grading by using what's called a REC 709 or a REC 2020 color LUT for the camera and the shooting profile that they were using. Like if they're on a um, black magic camera, they might have shot in B raw. Or if they were using a Canon camera, they might have just shot in C log. Or if they're on a Sony camera, S log. All of those have a slightly different look to them. And so to get them to look like what's called Rec 709 or Rec 2020, which is just a standard, uh, standardized color profile for like broadcast and things like that. Um, People start with that, they tell the, the computer what camera they have, they input the LUT, the lookup table, and it adjusts all the colors to give them a starting point. Depending on what you're shooting, it doesn't always work, it doesn't always look good, but it does kind of speed up the process a bit to give you a starting point that looks better than what you started with, with um, B raw or C log or S log, because those look very desaturated and milky and ugly. And then you can make adjustments from there after you get the lookup table um, to make it look more like what you were going for. I actually have this open. This is from our short film. And our short film was in, we wanted a one light, one room scene. So 
we actually want it to be a lot darker than you would for most images. If you look at our, this is the ungraded, uncorrected, straight out of the camera look that we have. So it's a little milky. The blacks aren't completely dark. You can see part of this wall over here. Um, you know, you can see the separation between the two parts of the wall and it's just a little milky. It doesn't look too saturated. It doesn't look too highly contrasted. If we look at our tools, we got the waveform. We see that there's a bunch of, it's just a kind of a flat line for most of it. And that's because there's no, not really any information. On the right side of the screen and the right side of the waveform, we see that it's pretty much just a line on the, on the 20 and uh, near the zero a little bit. That's because it's all just pretty black. There's not really any information over there. So there's not really anything. There's still some information. We just don't really see it. We don't really notice it. But if we bring it all the way down to zero, for instance, let me actually use this one. If we bring it all the way down to zero, We'll start seeing that it starts looking, let me see. Let's bring the brightness down. That's not even at zero. Obviously, you know, this is uh, affecting the entire image, including our subject in the middle. But now we have the line all the way at the bottom. And so at the right, it looks very different all the way dark compared to if we have it back at uh, zero. Might not really be able to tell, but there is a slight difference and it's like some information and you will be able to tell, especially with a film, with moving images, with scene, even though it's a really dark area, if it's completely black, if blacks are completely crushed, you can kind of tell the difference between that and something that has a little bit of information there as if you can almost see through the dark, even if you really can't because it's just, there's not enough light, there's still something there that uh, is just different than having it completely crushed to black. Now, when we color grade it for real, um, I'm not a master of color grading. I did do like a slight adjustment just to show what it can do. I have Premiere Pro CS 5.5, so, they didn't even introduce adjustment layers in this version of Premiere Pro. That didn't happen until CS6. And now, you know, they have CS, uh, now they have CC, which is the Creative Cloud online. Uh, so they update it continuously and it has new things all the time. But for mine back, you know, mine was, I don't even know how old this one is. It's pretty old. So it doesn't have all of the adjustable things. It doesn't even have a lumetry color curves and all of that. So I'll kind of explain what I did and how I adjusted it. But if I was really doing this, I would either get DaVinci Resolve or I would get um, Premiere Pro CC to start working on having more options for color grading if I was trying to do it, uh, like if I was actually trying to do the color grade myself. But yeah, so if we, um, so if we take that brightness, we crush it all the way down to blacks. We might wanna do that in the actual thing. I don't know, but obviously we don't wanna just bring the brightness down because now our subject's too dark. So there's a lot of different things you have to do to get that exposure correct. Uh, what I think I did, oh, but wait, let me go back to this real quick. So we also have in the top right, we can see that his skin tone is actually, it's pretty aligned with that line. You know, there's not too, too much color information in this image itself. So uh, this line, it's not extending towards the blues or any color because there's not really any color there. It's just him, his skin tone. There's a slight blue light hitting his side of the face and he's wearing gray shirt. So it's all very mid-tone, very basic. And it kind of matches the wall with all the gray. So not too much color information there. It's why it just has one single line, but we can see that if we line it up, let me see, can I make that bigger? If we line it up with the, this, the flesh line, which is right here, we look at it, you guys can see my mouse hopefully. But anyway, if we line it up, it, it lines up with that line pretty well. I don't want it to line up exactly on the line because then it's gonna be way too saturated. And if we saturate it over the top, it'll, it'll actually hit that line 
which you don't always want uh, because you don't really want it to be that saturated. Remember that the, the further these stretch out towards the edge of the circle, the more saturated the look will be. So as long as it lines up with that line, that's all you really want for the skin tone thing. So as far as white balance goes, even though we're on the uncorrected, ungraded version, the white balance is pretty good. I think we white balanced it on set. And so it is uh, pretty accurate to what the skin tone actually looks like. Uh, if we add some color in and we, we add some contrast in a second. We can also see this on the RGB parade, red, green, blue parade. And we can see that uh, red is a tiny bit down and blue is a little bit down compared to green. Green's a little higher than the other two, but, but for the most part, they are pretty even. There's not too much uh, difference there. They all have the kind of same spikes. They all have the same amount of information. Obviously all the information is coming from the middle because he's in the middle and he's the one that has, he's the different color there because everything else is just gray or black. So he's the one that has the most information and the most light because the light's hitting him. There's a little bit of an arm on the left side of each of the, of the waveforms because of the wall on the actual image. You can see the wall is a little gray. So it does have a little bit of more information there, which is why you see that little, little arm. But nothing is in the highlights. And so when you're correcting this image, this one specifically, and this is why it matters what you're doing and what your, what your image is or what your, your uh, scene is. Um, when I white balance it, or not white balance it, when I, when I, use, when I um, correct the exposure, I don't want anything to go up to the near 100 area because there are no highlights in this image. There's nothing bright. There are none. They're all midtones, undertones, and shadows. That's the whole image. So if I was trying to stretch this waveform out to get this part near the top, near the 100, and the other part near the zero, it would be way too bright. It would, let me see if I can uh, Yeah, even putting it at 100, it doesn't even go, it only goes up to like 80 doesn't even get near 100, as you can see. And basically all that's doing is just bringing up my midtones and the undertones up. And that you're even bringing the shadows up a lot. So the whole image is looking milky, it's looking ugly. It doesn't work. So remember, whatever you are shooting, that's going to affect what kind of waveform you have. Don't always think you need it to stretch from zero to 100. If you have a lot of different highlights and shadows in your image, then yes, you want some of it to reach near 100 and you want some of it to reach near zero without going over 100 or without going under zero. But if you're doing a really dark image or if you're doing a really bright image, you're not really gonna have too much information in the darks or the brights, the highlights or the shadows. So you don't really need to worry about the waveform stretching out to those areas. Since this is just a dark image, skin tone is in the mid-tone area and everything else is gray and black, um, it's actually all right to have it be a little closer just to only being like mid-tones and shadows area. I just wanted to point that out. So color correcting it, I just did a slight color correction where I added a bit of color to it. Um, what else do I do? Let me see. I took away the brightness just a tiny bit, about three points, added two of, of contrast, RGB color corrector. I, um, I believe I upped the saturation. I don't actually know what I do with that, but with the fast color corrector, and these are all just different tools that I have available on mine because mine's older. These are probably still in the newer one, but 
again, whatever you're using, it's going to have different tools. So you just have to kind of test them out to see what works for you. Saturation, I upped it to about 168 compared to when it was at 100. That's pretty much all I did for the color correction. Um, I didn't really do anything else. With the color grade, I made it a bit darker on him because he's the only one that's lit up. So I didn't want him to look too bright. So you can see the difference. I also, since I don't have in this version of Premiere Pro, I don't have the tool that allows me to select a color and tell it to change that specific color. If I did, what I would have done is I would have selected the wall because it's a very dark gray. And I would have just adjusted it a bit to try to get it to tell it to be black or to match, you know, the rest of the room because it is different. It is a, it's a slightly brighter dark gray um, compared to this, which is more black or very dark gray behind him and behind the rest of the room. But what I did, because I didn't have that tool, is I just created a mask a color mat. I did the opacity at 39% and I just used a garbage mat to kind of shape it. Uh, you can see it right there. Oops. Uh, let me, there we go. I just kind of shaped it around the area that I wanted to get rid of. Um, it's not perfect, perfectly aligned with the table like I would want it to be, you know, and I'd obviously spend a lot more time on it if I was doing it for real, but that's the only way I could do it. And this is the only tool I had available, then that's what I would do. So sometimes even if you don't have these new tools or if you don't have the specific things, you can get creative and try to figure out ways to do certain things that you want, even if you don't have these you know, specific things that you've seen in other applications. You know, When I was seeing all this stuff for color grading, color correcting, I was like, oh, sweet. I didn't even know Premiere Pro had that. I got into it and I was like, oh yeah, of course mine doesn't because mine's older. So I had to like figure out ways around it. But you can see the difference between this, if I turn it off and turn it on. Give me a bit. So if I take it away, oh wait, no, not the garbage man. If I actually just take away the whole thing. Why is it not doing it? Huh, well. What are you trying to do? Trying to toggle it on and off to show you guys like that there's, you know, the gray. Um, well, well, I think you have your, uh, I think you have your, garbage mat set to not inverse right or yeah but like, i was just because, turning off you know the little eye of the actual like right because uh, well but the opacity i don't know I, it seems to me like the when the the opacity is like toggled on and off then it goes to default which is 100 and if your garbage mat was set to take out everything then it's just going to default to that Gotcha. Well, I was trying to show. <laughs> you could also, uh, you could, could you, could you mute the, the top track? That's what I was doing. So I was like, huh, it's not working. Oh, there we go. You can kind of see it. It is hard to see, but you can kind of see it if you look. Moral of the story is Coda needs an update fast. <laughs> yeah. Either way, that's what I did because I didn't have the tools. Um, and it took away that part of the wall that looked a lot more gray than the rest. Made it look black and make it match the rest of the, uh, the scene since he kind of stays in the middle the whole time. And then I know this stuff looks ugly because I was just trying to show you guys really quickly. Um, I made one that was a little more blue. I don't like the way it looks exactly, but I was just showing like just a different variation on it. Make it look a little more blue, a little less colorful, like this one. 
This one's a little more warm tones. This one's a little, I, I took away some of the saturation, added the blue a little bit just to make it a little more of a colder feel. I would adjust this a lot more if I was actually doing it again. Um, and then I did one that was a little more green, a little more sickly, just to, just to give you a different look. So none of these are really wrong. None of these are really right for the color grade. That's where the creativity comes in and what you want and really where the emotion of the film or the scene comes in. Color plays a huge part into how we perceive that scene. You've, um, if you've ever seen one of those, those comparisons on a film that has like one, the, the happy scene is very bright, colorful and orange tungsten-y look. And the sadder scenes are less saturated. They have a bit more of a blue hue to them. And they just look a bit sadder because we just associate blue with, with sad. And we associate, you know, orange with warm and sunny and happy. So those two things can really affect the scene in general, just from color temperature. And then you have different colors you can add like green and, and yellow and all these other colors that you can do to affect how it feels, how it looks. You want it to seem maybe like he's a little more sickly, give him a little bit more of a yellow hue um, to, to just make it seem like, I don't know, this guy's sick, maybe, you know, give that kind of feel. So maybe we shouldn't really care about what this guy says, make it more blue, more sad and monotone, make it more colorful, bright, warm so that we're on his side you know different things like that will really affect how the feel of that scene comes across what the feeling is and what the emotion is of the scene so that's why color grading is so important and next semester we're going to talk about um, production design color theory with production design and how that aligns with color with the cinematography and the, um, you know, the color grade and post-production, all those things kind of need to align to, to really sell that scene, that character and things like that. So we'll kind of see how those all blend together when we're talking about it next semester. But with color grading in general, you can just affect the overall look, the stylistic choices, how dark or how bright it is, how what color it is and how colorful it is and how saturated it is. You know, is it, is it more black and white? Does it feel a little more, you know, color, more colors are gonna make it more friendly seeming and, and less colors is gonna make it more sad, depressing or real feeling. So then it'll feel maybe a little more depressing. So it just really depends on what you're going for. And there are no right or wrong answers because if you like the look, if you like the way it feels for your scene, then that should be the look that you go with because you, uh, there are no wrong answers. So um, does anyone have anything to add? Any comments or questions on color grading, color correcting or anything? I would just say like completing your, what you just said. Yeah, it's called color theory for a reason. Like it's not a rule. It's just something that, um, like it's a psychological theory it's um connected to our emotions and peer studies and stuff like that but there have been people who push the envelope or try to play with those colors a little bit to give you a mix of emotions or even tones not even emotions but the tone of of the show or the film or something like that oh the last thing i was going to actually add um color correcting i think i have it why not? Well, maybe it was the color grade. Hold on. Yeah, okay. RGB curves. So curves. Um, if you're looking at curves, um, there's a few different color type tools. There's what's called color wheels, which um no. Where's the fast color grade? All right, color wheels look like this. And so you can grab the middle and you can adjust it more towards one side or the other. And what you'll be doing is adding more of that color to the overall scene. You see, I brought it more up to the ready 
to the red orange area and now the whole scene looks more orange. Um, I bring in the middle more towards the blue, giving it more of that. Well, you know, now it looks like we're in an alien spaceship or something that a crappy sci-fi film. <laughs> Um, so it, it affects the entire image, the darks, the, the mid-tones, the lights, but there are color um, tools, especially in newer applications and, and the newer version of Premiere Pro, which allow you to adjust the color of just the shadows, the mid-tones, or the highlights. And they can use color wheels like this. If we grab the outside of the wheel and we start moving it around, it's going to change the overall color. You know, it's, there's still blue in the middle, but it's now it's a little bit of green. You see his skin tone's a little green now with blue on the outside. So blue overall, because I'm bringing the saturation over that way, but green because I changed where the color wheel aligns. You know, if I bring it to red, it, it affects things too. So there's a lot of different things you can do with that. It's starting, it does start to get a little unreal. I mean, obviously it starts to get unrealistic looking, but color wheels can also just be used for very slight movement towards one color or the other. I think I even had it up towards the reds. Uh, if I was having it more like how the natural wheel is. I had it more towards the reds so his skin tone stuck out a little bit more. So that's what I did when I was, when I was color correcting it. But yeah, so there's color wheels, which, which work like that. There's an outside ring and there's the inside and you can drag the middle one side or the other. And then you can adjust the outside of the wheel to change the overall color spectrum, which adjusts what's called the hue angle. Um, and then there are red, green, and blue curves, or you know, just regular curves. And these again, you can adjust them for each uh, shadows, midtones, undertones, and highlights overtones, I guess, are in between highlights and uh, midtones as well. And what you do is now we have too much green in the image. So with the color, with a uh, color curve, if I'm taking it from the middle, that means I am going to affect the entire curve, but I'm mostly affecting the midtones. The way color, the way um, color curves work, the bottom left is the shadows, Top right is the highlights, the middle is midtones, then you have you know, undertones in between shadows and midtones, and overtones in between the highlights and the midtones. So if I just take the midtone itself and bring it down and adjust this whole thing, it's gonna take away some of that green. See, a lot of that green got away from the, from the image now. If I wanted to maybe make the highlights be really high with the green, but the but the uh, shadows have no green. There you go. Now it looks like, I don't know, maybe it's near a spaceship that's taking off. And <laughs> now he's turning red. So the more you adjust these, the more you start to affect. Now I can add green to the, to the low, to the uh, shadows, I mean, see? Because I'm adjusting this part of the curve. And obviously, the more you affect it, the, the more less realistic it gets and the higher it uh, adjust the entire image. We just took out the entire amount of green that we just added earlier by adjusting this curve, but we adjusted it too much. So now it's just really dark. It's pretty much only red and some blues. Um, so yeah, like these can really help to adjust certain things if you wanna adjust highlights and the, and the shadows of certain colors or the midtones you wanna bring it up to make it more red, things like that. You can really adjust it. What people usually do with the white line, the master, which is all three of the colors, is they make a slight, what's called an S curve. And that is basically going to add contrast to your original image. So if you, um, let me just go to this one. This one doesn't have much color contrast. This is the color correction before we've done anything to it. Um, and so if I wanted to add contrast manually to it, instead of using this contrast wheel, because it's going to do something I don't really want, I could go to RGB curves, bring it onto the thing, and then I could make 
a slight adjustment to the master curve. And that would be bringing down the shadows a tiny bit and bringing up the highlights a little bit. It's called an S curve because you're starting to make that curve appear as an S if you look at it from the side. You know, it's going, it's looping up and down. Obviously, the more drastic you make it, the more the darks are going to get darker and the more the whites are going to get whiter. And it's going to start adjusting the way the whole image looks. And then you can, you know, add extra adjustments if you want to. But yeah, that's, that's uh, used a lot in almost every single color correction. Whenever you're, whenever you're color correcting it, a lot of people will grab a curve, do a slight S curve, not to this extent, but there's barely just to really get slight adjustments in there to add a little bit of contrast um, to affect the image without adjusting anything else. And then they'll start making other adjustments. A lot of things with color correcting and color grading is, you know, you have to be really slight with, you do slight corrections, slight little adjustments to make it look different. Because every single thing you do is going to make the overall image appear a bit different. If I grab this red line from the middle and I just adjust it a tiny bit up, it already makes it a little more red. It makes the skin tone look a little more um, red. And I just barely adjusted it. I tiny, it's just a tiny bit up. Obviously, if I take it to the extreme, now the whole thing is completely red and it's really ugly. But you know, that's why you want to be very slight with your movements when you're when you're adjusting all these things. And they actually make um, these color panels. If you're like serious about color correcting, they make like color color grade panel, I think. Like that, which have like little curves so you can, you know, move a ball back and forth to make it have these really slight movements. So it's not too hard because when you're using a mouse, it's a bit harder to get that precision that you can get from one of those. So if you're really serious about it, um, most, most actual commercial colorists are going to have a platform like that or a bigger one, you know, that has every single adjustment that the software uses mapped out to it kind of like a keyboard but it'll just have a it'll have a lot more precision than you would get with a mouse all right so moving on from that hold up can i oh yeah go ahead add to that um you, you, what you said was pretty accurate. It's just I, I think some of your terminology crosses in with uh, the differences between color correcting and color grading. So color color correcting is more of a seen more of a taboo than it is than than color grading. Color grading is good. Color correcting is more a negative because it's in the word correcting, meaning something is wrong. So um, like, like the example you just gave with the color, with the, with the S curve, with the color curves, that's more on the, uh, the color grading side. Um, you can affect colors with the color curve, but a lot of times they'll just go on the basic where they, they pull all the colors at the same time and curve it with an S. But that's more on the color, um, the color grading. Color correcting is more like, you have three different, like this wedding I just shot, we had three different cameras, completely different cameras. So the color tones and and just everything is gonna look different because you're shooting with, I, mean, I had my Black Magic, I had my Fuji. Uh, we had one camera guy, he had the Canon and he had another one who had a Sony. So you had three different sensors, three different colors. So the editor is going to have to pick one camera to go off of and correct the other ones to try to match that. Um, so that's where you get color correcting from. So let's just say you, you're whoever you whoever got the footage for you. Let's just say they didn't know how to white balance. So you'd have to color correct the footage to to get it to look appropriate. So like he had his his white balance set to tungsten, but he shot outside. Everything is going to be like super blue when he you know when he's shooting outside. Right. So you yeah. have to color correct it 
to make it take a lot of that blue out. Color grading is like everything you just said. It's, it's a stylistic choice. You're taking colors out, putting colors in. You're also adjusting exposures and whatnot. And all this is done by a professional they call um, a colorist, a professional colorist who is in charge of doing all that. So once the final edit is done and they're on picture lock, they'll send it over to a colorist to do that. And I guess that's where the cinematographer steps in. But uh, things to know, like what camera, this is where it's important to know what camera was shot. Um, because every camera has a different calibration for skin tones and for all that good stuff. And um, so when you're mixing and matching footage, um, let's say you, you'll say have one camera, like I say DSLR is affected differently than a Black Magic's Black B-Raw footage. So like, you know, you can't just take, oh man, you know, you can't just make LUTs for a specific camera. You know, you'd have to, that's why it's so important to know which camera you're shooting and all that metadata metadata is all important because um, every camera sensor is different and the codex they you know that they're giving to you is going to respond differently to the uh, to the uh, filters you, you're using with it so th it's that's important um, cuz you know you if you shoot with DSLR you might get well to definitely you shoot DSLR, you're going to get more colors out of it than if you were to shoot a cinema camera. So just, they try to make it less colors and all, all that good stuff, more soft. Um, normally, they, I, there was a term they would like to use for, for DSLR. They call it, um, the DSLR, they used to call it snappy because the, the, the contrast was so, like the blacks were a lot of times were over crushed and the highlights were, um, too high, you know, a lot of times, specifically with Canon when they first came out. Um, so they invented that word snappy. This word I, I, I heard a lot. It was like, oh, this, you know, when you hear people say, I don't know, like it just doesn't look, you know, that's what the word they come up with. Snappy is the word where um, your contrast is, is too, either too low or too high, one or the other. Um, if it's, too, if it's too, I, th I believe it's like too high. Um, you want to add some contrast. I'm, I'm going off, but, but you get the just what I'm saying, right? Yeah. So if it's too, if it's the contrast is too much, you want to, you want to bring it back a bit. If it's too low, you want to add some contrast to it. Yeah, that that was a big issue with, um, with DSLR. Like, uh, it was just too snappy. Like you couldn't. It was just too much contrast and like the colorist would always try to whoever was color grading was always fighting to try to like because you know everybody wanted that quote unquote film look which was like you're not going to get it on a dslr um no matter how many filters you put on there so like people were constantly trying to like so then they started making lots and and what is called log mode and stuff like that and it, it, it's just pretty much a setting in the camera that just takes all that it makes everything a flat image, everything flat. Because originally the design of the camera was like when they designed the camera, they were designing it for, for dummies. You know what I mean? They were just like, oh, we'll just we'll make all these presets in the camera and this is what people want. But you know, the professionals don't want that. They want to be able to control everything and stuff like that. They don't want the camera telling them, you know, what exposures to be at, what, you know, all this stuff like that. Right. Um, that was the biggest thing. Like, like getting fighting that that preset that was already in the camera, so I, and I guess you know they got they got hip to it and were like, all right, well let's just create these these logs where you know we'll give it flat, but you know those things aren't flattering to the consumer you know, like normal people that are buying cameras. Like log footage is unappealing. Like if you were to sell somebody log footage, they you know oh man this camera sucks, but um <laughs> yeah it's very ugly. <laughs> us we love it. Like the professionals they love they they want that. Imagine. Imagine what it's gonna look like when they put the saturation filter on it. Like, yeah, um, but yeah, that was the whole thing about DSLRs versus cinema cameras and film cameras and stuff like that. It was, you know, the DSLRs were were too quote unquote snappy. Like, oh man, it just has the DSLR look to it, and you know. And then finally, they just said, you know what? We'll just give them a log and uh, Canon create. I think Canon was like the first one to create the uh, 
the log. I can't remember the one, the name they had, but it was it created this log, this log style where everything was like super flat and you know, just super desaturated, super flat. And it was like everything everybody wanted because it was like, oh, you get to have a DSLR, but then you get to have a a flat look to try to get that film look, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that that's really that's what it all really really boils down to is like getting it in post and, and color grading it towards the end. Um, and you have a decision you want to make. Like, do you want it to make it look like a you know film because then you will go with less colors, or do you want to try to make it look more um, sharp, crisp, clear, more video like? You know, you can go either way. Um, and like you were saying, like Da Vinci um, is is. They, like I said, they've changed now. They changed their software to look more like the editors. But before, when you would open DaVinci, it would just have what you were just showing with the color wheels. It was just nothing but like wheels and, and circles and stuff like that. Um, that shouldn't intimidate you too much because um, they, they've given you options. Like you can do the wheels if you want. Or you can do the bars. Like me, personally, I, I'm more comfortable with the bars because they come with numbers, and then I can easily just copy them and you know just go. Oh, it's at a hundred. So like, if I ever want to know, you know, what did I have those numbers to last time? I'll just go to the numbers as opposed to try. I mean, the wheels have numbers too, but it's more like it'll come with a set of like three numbers you got to memorize as opposed to a bar. You know, you only got to remember like three different. You know, but um. You can, you can you have the option if you want the wheel you can do the wheel but then somewhere it'll it'll let you pick and choose like oh do you want the bar version of it um, and then I'd also mentioned last class like you were showing the histogram and stuff like that some people like uh, they don't even look at the footage they'll just go and they'll just put in a bunch of numbers and stuff like that through the histogram and they'll look at the histogram and then then they'll look at the picture and stuff like that which isn't ideal in my opinion but some people know how to do that and I, you know, but. Some people like trusting the, uh, the data rather than testing their eyes. Oh yeah, that, that's another thing about it. The data, like you just said, the data, the, the cool thing about those histograms, like you said, is that those are absolute. The histograms are absolute. Your monitor is not absolute. I mean, nowadays, like all these monitors are, are pretty calibrated. Like my Samsung phone matches my Samsung TV, like perfectly is identical um but a sony tv like might have well i think sony has way more colors than a a samsung does but it might not look the same on a sony than it than it does on a on a samsung but um those numbers like if you if you know like hey these are like you were just showing like if it's within this range it should be safe you know what i mean Mm -hmm. um that that's what that's for so like people that use those histograms are are using them for a specific reason i know it's like you know oh you got to look at it which is true but um for the people like i had mentioned for the people who only use histograms like that's what they're doing they're they're getting it like color safe so that way like when it's being projected on different platforms and stuff like that the colors aren't like all over the place with it um because there is a difference like a, t- a television a computer can produce like three million more colors than an actual television can um and if your mainstream is television um and you're editing on a computer you could really really mess up <laughs> because the television will be trying to make up colors that don't really exist and on its on a on a scale or in a center or whatnot because mm-hmm. your computer can go yeah that's what that's about the histograms are that's or pretty what should i say that's why that is important to know about histograms and try to use them a little bit or just know the basic functions and like where the safe zones are so you know like hey if i'm in here i should be good you don't have to be like Mm -hmm. professional at it but just know yeah, and then the more you use them, the more, like I said, the more you use them, the more you get used to them. Once you, especially once you're watching the, the bars and actually change as you make an adjustment, you start getting used to what they are, what they look like, what they mean, and uh, it, it's not as crazy as you might think when you first start seeing it all. 
Um, we will be making an exercise out of color grading. Uh, that'll be due, due April 7th with the other exercise, the one with the, uh, the editing. So you can combine those two to make a different color grade for that if you want, or you can make it a separate thing. And basically you're just gonna take a screenshot or a short clip and you're gonna just use whatever software is available to you. Um, or you can download DaVinci Resolve if you want to start practicing with that, or you can pay for a month of one of the other ones if you want to try getting some of the newer um, tools and things like that. And then you will just take that and we will color grade a piece of footage, whether it's yours or you just found it from somewhere or just a picture to your liking and just change the way it looks adding a stylistic choice of the color and the exposure and things like that to it to make it look different than what it did originally. Because when you have different looks, you can make a bunch of different looks as you can see in like this image right here, even just picking what's called LUTs, it's gonna look very different compared to all the different ones that you use where you can really start to adjust the certain parts of the image, just her skin, just the background, or you can adjust the whole thing at once, um, doing manual controls and doing LUTs can really affect what an image might look like. And all of them will look different and give you a slightly different feeling of, of uh, what they are. So something to consider and just to get really used to color grading or, and like what goes into it. So I'll, I'll be emailing that out tomorrow. All right, so now we're gonna talk about lenses. This stuff comes from ZY Chang, uh, letter A in the syllabus. We're gonna talk first about what to look for when you are buying used lenses. So used lenses, obviously, you know, it's a lot cheaper than buying brand new ones, but you do have to look out for quite a bit to make sure that they are going to work properly. Um, and even after you look through all these things, you might not be able to fully know whether they're going to work for you or not. So it is somewhat of, more of a gamble than buying brand new, of course, but there are some things you can look out for if you are buying used lenses. If you're buying these lenses, Obviously, the first thing you're going to check for is if it has any scratches on the front or back or has any dings in the actual glass of the lens. There's glass in the back with, that connects to the camera and then the front where the lens is exposed to the elements. And as you can see on the screen, there's the scratch in the middle. And that can really affect the image, especially depending on how thick that scratch is and where it is on the lens. So if it does have any scratches, you do wanna see some pictures from it because if it is right in the middle, it's gonna appear in the image itself. And even if it's not right in the center, oftentimes scratches, hard to get out of lenses. There are some things that claim that they can repair them, you know, like you, you rub it and it repairs them and some work somewhat, but it really depends on the scratch and the thing you're trying to use to repair them. Oftentimes if they have a bunch of scratches, it's really beaten up you have to replace the, uh, the glass on the lens, which can cost quite a bit of money. And then you might just wanna go ahead and buy a brand new lens if that's the case. So it doesn't have an image like this where there's scratches and screeches going across everywhere if that's what is on the front of the lens when you check it out. So clearly, you know, obviously that should be the first thing you check for. Make sure neither side has any scratches or any smears or anything like that because that will affect the actual image itself. You also want to check the lens barrel um, to see if it has any heavy scratches, like some normal wear and tear is fine if some of the words are sort of rubbed off because people are moving the lens back and forth or some of the, um, it has a few scratches from heavy use. That's, that's not that bad, but if it has really heavy scratches or dents in it in the side, in the barrel of the lens, that could mean that it was dropped or bumped a lot or just mishandled. Um, and that can, that can be bad. That can mean that, you know, even if it seems like it's working well, 
It could have problems internally that you're not really aware of until you get it and you try to use it and you see that there's some, some stuff's messed up or some parts don't really work as properly as they should because that thing's been dropped. Some lenses work perfectly fine after drop. So it's not exactly a complete deal breaker, but it is definitely something to look out for if you're gonna to try to buy used lenses. When you're buying a used lens, you also wanna turn the focus and the zoom rings, make sure that they don't get stuck or make any noises. So uh, I think I have, you know, you have the rings right here and right there for zoom. If you have a zoom lens, there's gonna be a zoom where you can zoom in and out on the lens. And there's gonna be the focus ring where you can adjust the focus. If you just have a prime lens, you will just have the focus. Um, and you really wanna make sure that those can go back and forth smoothly and that they aren't going to get stuck or have any kind of bumps or noises because that is a red sign, a red flag, I mean, and something that you probably want to avoid. You also wanna take the front and back lens caps off and point the lens towards a light source and check for any dust or fungus that might be inside the lens as it will appear backlit like this. Dust will appear as like little marks or little black specks. You wanna make sure first of all that there's none on the outside of the lens, you know, on the glass, the back or the front. Clearly if there's any dust on there that it can affect the image, but Internally, there can also be some either fungus or, or dust inside the lens itself, especially if it was just left out on a shelf, you know, it can get dust and the dust can eventually get inside of the lens and then it can affect the image when you are using it. So even if the front and back look clean and they look good, you just wanna take it, point it towards the light, make sure that there's no little specks that appear anywhere because things like that or things like this will get really irritating and noticeable for you really quickly. With photography, it's not as bad because um, it's a little less noticeable and you can edit it out, I guess. But with any kind of film or video, you will notice the spec immediately because right when stuff changes, but that little black spec or that little black circle stays for the entire thing, you're gonna notice it and it's gonna drive you crazy. So you wanna make sure that it doesn't have that. It doesn't have anything like that. You can clean them out, but again, that's going to cost money. So then you want to debate whether it's worth it to just get a new lens or not. And even if there is like dust on the inside, it might not actually affect the image. So you do want to kind of attach to the camera, pointing it to somewhere with highlights. Uh, you can add as much blur as you'd like. And usually the blur will sort of reveal where the black specks are like that. And if it has it, then you can see that it is going to affect the image. But if you can't see it anywhere, then um, it doesn't really matter as much. So that is something to, to check out. And then, then you just want to open and close the aperture, making sure that it's not going to jam up and that it works properly when closed and fully closed and when fully open. So with lenses, when you're going to go buy lenses, if you're gonna go buy new ones or used ones, you have prime lenses, which is on the left, and you have zoom lenses, which is on the right. Prime lenses only have one focal length. So if it's a 50 millimeter prime lens, it can only do 50 millimeters focal length. If it's a zoom lens, it can alternate between different focal lengths by zooming in or out. So if it's like a 24 to 70 millimeter zoom lens, it means it can be anywhere from 24 millimeters focal length to 70 millimeters focal length. Zoom lenses also allow you to zoom in and out during a shot, though most of the time, from what I can tell, filmmakers try to avoid it because of the way it compresses and decompresses the background and the foreground. And they try instead to do dolly moves, moving the physically moving the camera forward and backward instead of zooming in and out because it just looks a little less professional. Now there are certain moves like a dolly and zoom where you try to get a certain effect going, where you might want to, where you would have to have a zoom lens or you'd have to do digital zoom, but it won't really work the same. Um, so to, to get certain effects, you do need a zoom lens. 
Um, but you that just depends on the specific shot that you need or want. Not every time you you uh, you won't always want to zoom in. Basically, you'll you'll usually want to move in and out whenever you're doing a more professional looking shot. Only in certain use cases will you want to zoom in for the most part. Because zoom messes with the, the compression, how close the background looks to the foreground and things like that, as well as the depth of field, how shallow and how um, deep it is. Uh, let me see, prime lenses can often open up their aperture more than a zoom lens can as well. So they can often have, they, they, they work better in low light situations because you can open the aperture fully and get in as much light as you need. Well, maybe not as much as you need, but more than you can on a zoom lens. And prime lenses are typically a bit sharper than zoom lenses. Now it depends on what kind of zoom lens you're getting. Of course, if you get a $1,000 zoom lens instead of a $200 prime lens, that $1,000 might be better at all these things. But if you're trying to get the same price range, um, then the prime lenses are typically going to be better for sharpness. Aperture is gonna be able to open up more and some other things like that. Some zoom lenses have what's called variable apertures which means that if you have a zoom lens that is like 25 to 70 millimeters, let's say, so it can go from 25 millimeters and it can zoom in to 70 or anywhere in between with a aperture of F4 to F5.6, that can mean that the 25 millimeter aperture can open to F4, which means it can open a bit, bit, a bit wider. But when it zooms in to 70 millimeters, it can only open up to f5.6. So the aperture actually closes down a little bit. That's something you really need to know if you're trying to buy a zoom lens because you want to make sure that you understand what it's going to do if you're zooming in. If you are zooming in and it's closing the aperture, it's going to have less light. So it's going to get a little bit darker as you zoom in. And it's also going to make that depth of field deeper so it's going to have more of the background in focus as you zoom in. So those are two things you got to keep in mind when you're talking about zoom lenses, prime lenses, things like that. So with the aperture, it's the F or the T number that you see on the lens or on the listing and wherever you're buying it from. And it tells you how wide open the aperture can get a wider aperture will have a smaller F number or T number. So 1.4 is better than 1.8 because it can open up a bit more. The lower the number, the wider the aperture can get, which means the more light it can get in, which means it works better in low light situations. And it also means that the depth of field will be shallower, which means the background, if you're focused on a subject, the background will be blurrier, the wider the aperture gets. Um, so that is something to keep in mind when you're talking about, about lenses. A wider aperture also lets in more light. I already said that. Oh, it allows you to raise your shutter speed if you are taking, if you are taking photos, for instance. With film, this isn't really as big of a deal, but with photos, if you're taking photos, you want a wider aperture because then you can up your shutter speed as much as you want. Well, you can up the shutter speed even more. So if you hear somebody talk about how a lens is fast, oh, this is a really fast lens. What they mean is it can open the aperture up really wide. It has a small F or T number because you can up the shutter speed and make it faster make it you know, really quickly to take that picture to capture whatever they need to capture. So a faster lens has a wider aperture and a smaller F number. The price of these lenses are also a lot different depending on those 
um, how wide the aperture can get, how fast the lens is. A aperture, whenever you're buying a lens, it's going to list the smallest number it can open up to because all of them can close down to a really small amount and have like infinity. Um, well, I don't know about all of them, but a lot of them can have like inf basically infinity focus, which means it'll just have everything in focus at its smallest point where if you open it all the way, it'll have a very shallow depth of field where some of them, depending on what you're, what kind of focal length you're using, which we'll get into in just a second, they might only allow you to have the eyes in focus while even something as like the nose is out of focus, depending on how close you are to the subject and what kind of focal length you're using with that lens. So the shallower the depth of field, the more control you have over like what is in focus, what isn't, but it is also harder, especially with filming, to get the focus correct and keep it correct, the shallower you are. With the smaller F number, because it gives you more control, they are more expensive, especially because of the way they're designed and just what they're made out of and how they work, they, they're just more costly. They, they cost a lot more than their counterparts that can only open to a small a larger number. So you bought a, a 50 millimeter lens from Canon and it's the same exact thing. It just has one that can open to 2.8 and one that can open to 1.4. The 1.4, it might cost, you know, two, three times as much as the one that can open 2.8. So that's something to keep in mind when you're talking about lenses and buying them is the, the smaller the F number that it can get to, the more expensive it will be because it gives you a bit more control because you can always leave it at 2.8, but you can also open it even more if you want to. Whereas the one at 2.8, you can't open it any more than that. We're talking about focal lengths. Oh, well, this kind of shows you what happens whenever you're talking about the aperture opening or closing. You can see on the right, <clears throat> the depth of field, the, if you're having that, those animals in focus, the background gets a lot more blurry as you open the aperture up. The f-stop shows the number. So as the number gets bigger, we are closing down that aperture, making it more uh, smaller. And as the number gets smaller, we are opening that aperture up. It also shows the exposure gets brighter or darker as you open or close down your f-stop or your aperture, I mean. And then it shows how much blurriness or how clear it can get as you um, open and close your aperture. So again, the more open the aperture is, the, the shallower the depth of field, the blurrier the background is going to be for whatever you have in focus. The smaller the aperture, the larger the F number, the less light gets in and the more stuff is in focus. The background, the foreground, and the midground are all in focus. Whereas, you know, the, the shallower you get, you can only have one thing in focus, midground, foreground, or background. Everything else will be blurry. And how blurry it is depends on what kind of focal length you're using. Focal length is that mm number, that millimeter number. The lower the number is, the wider the lens is. So a 16 millimeter lens is, is a lot wider than a 200 millimeter lens since it's way more telephoto. And with 16 millimeter lenses and wide lenses, if you are really close to the subject, you can see in that middle picture, it starts to really bend people's faces or just makes certain things look a lot bigger than what they really are. So if you're near a building and you have a really wide lens, that one part of the, the building might look huge that's right next to you, while something farther off in the distance might look a lot smaller. You can sort of see that in the top left image. You can see that the building to the left, it's a bit bigger looking. Um, and then it starts, everything else looks way smaller, even though it's all kind of right next to each other. And you also have to see like how close she is when she's taking the picture for for the uh, this middle image. So she's really close with that wide angle lens and it's 
kind of shaping that girl's face and making it kind of condensed down and look a little thin and her hair looks very small and it just looked a little weird. Wide angle lenses for film are used to make a small area look really big, but the closer you get to certain elements, the larger they're going to appear in camera. So if you're, if you're doing the whole scene from far away, everything will look a lot bigger than it is. But if you're doing some elements are closer to the lens while some elements are far away, whatever's closer to the lens is just gonna look a lot larger than whatever's farther away from the lens, which will look much smaller. 35 millimeter and 50 millimeter lenses are considered like normal or standard or how kind of how we see the world when we're looking around at people. It, this is going to depend on what kind of camera sensor you have, which we'll get into in just a second. But um, with a full frame sensor, 35 and 50 millimeter lenses are considered like the standard um, and are most often the ones that are used for film and t television and things like that when it's just a normal situation. Then telephoto, oh, and also with wider angle lenses, you have more stuff in focus. So you can see on the top left, the background is very much in focus. If we go all the way down to the 200 millimeter lens, the background is a lot blurrier. And even, especially in that middle picture, you can really see that the background, the background gets very blurred out while keeping her in focus. The other thing about millimeters and like focal lengths is the less, the smaller the focal length, the wider angle lens, <clears throat> the wider the angle of the lens, um, the further separation there is between the background and the foreground. If you look at the top left, you can notice this a lot. Whenever we start going down the list, the background looks like it's closing in on the girl. It looks like she's getting closer and closer to that foliage, that tree. When in reality, she's sitting in the same spot. It's just the way the lens works. It's making it look like the background is closer to her than it is. So if we get to 200 telephoto, I mean, 200 uh, millimeter lens, the telephoto lens, uh, the background looks like it's right behind her head. It looks like if she leans her head to the side, she could have her head in that foliage, that tree that bush or whatever that is. But if we go all the way up to like 35 millimeter and 16 millimeter, we see, oh, it's actually a few feet, if not more than that, away from her. So if she does lean to the side, she's not gonna hit her head into that stuff. So that's also something to consider if you want it to feel like people are farther apart than they are, if you want it to feel like someone's right next to you, or especially for like a chase scene, you have to consider what kind of lens you might wanna get. And that's why usually when you're doing filmmaking and you're getting lenses, people will get a few different ones so that they have different options for different scenarios because one lens isn't gonna work for every situation if you want the feeling and the mood to be right um, across the board for your scene, all your scenes. But it also really depends on what kind of, of a camera sensor size you have. So different cameras will have different sensor sizes. Some will have what's called full frame. Some will have APS-C or what's called a crop sensor. And some will have a micro four thirds sensor. So Blackmagic pocket cinema cameras, they have micro four thirds, uh, Canon, C300, Mark IIs and threes. I think they all have the APS-C or the uh, crop sensor. And then the full frame are some DSLRs have them, some, um, some cinema cameras have them. They all, uh, different brands have different ones. I'm not sure exactly uh, specific ones that have them, but I do know a lot are starting to have them now. So this will affect your lens as well, because if you have the same lens on different cameras, 35 millimeter lens on a micro four thirds camera is going to look a lot bigger than it would on a full frame camera. You can see this on the right with the moose. If we were taking a picture of a moose in the wilderness and we had it on a full frame 
then we don't, then it's going to be 35 millimeter lens. There's no uh, what's called crop factor, which we'll get into in just a second. So it looks like that. That's what it looks like with 35 millimeters if you're standing at that distance, taking a picture of the moose. You go up and you have APS-C. You're going to have to do what's called a crop factor of 1.5. Or with the Canon ones, for some reason, they do 1.6 crop factor. So you do have to uh, know which camera you're getting to because that will affect it. So a 35 millimeter lens, why is it so huge? 35 millimeter lens on a crop sensor or an APS-C sensor with a 1.5 times crop factor, you're gonna have 35 times 1.5 it's going to look like a 52.5 millimeter lens would on a, on a full frame camera. So it's going to look a lot closer. So a 35 millimeter lens might not be looking as normal for your camera as it would for a full frame. When we're talking about standards, 35 and 50 are the standard looks. That's with a full frame camera sensor. Those are the standard looks that we kind of see in real life that look the most natural to us. But if you are getting, if you have a smaller sensor, a camera with a smaller sensor, then you need to make, get a, get a smaller uh, lens. The millimeter should be lower because it'll, um, it'll affect what it looks like. So if you wanted to get a 35 millimeter look, you'd have to divide it by 1.5. So you'd have to get like a 23 or a 24 millimeter lens on a crop sensor camera. And that would look like a 35 millimeter lens does on a full frame. With a micro four thirds camera, kind of like the, the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema, it's a crop factor of two. So you do the same thing. You take the 35 millimeter lens, but this time you're gonna multiply it by two. It's gonna look like a 70 millimeter lens. So with a, with a uh, black magic camera, you wanna get a, a lens that looks like a 35 millimeter. You have to take 35 divided by two. You wanna get something that's like a 17 or an 18 millimeter lens. And that'll look as close as it can to 35 as you'll get. If you wanna get a 50 millimeter lens, then with a, with a micro four thirds camera sensor, you wanna get a 25 millimeter lens. Cause you multiply that by two, it's gonna look like a 50 millimeter lens. Um, so that is something you have to keep in mind when you are talking about getting lenses and you want them to have different looks. It's going to look a lot more telephoto. As you can see in the picture, it's a lot more blurry in the background. It's a lot more zoomed in. It looks a lot more telephoto than the 35 millimeter does on a full frame sensor, where it looks more like what we think of when we're talking about 35 millimeter lenses. So you really have to do the math and figure out what kind of lenses you need to get that set. So you, um, if you're just beginning, you really want to try to get a wide lens, um, maybe one or two standard lenses, which is somewhere between 35 and 50 equivalent, and then a telephoto lens. That's really the, the basics everybody says to really start out with, just so you have one of each in case you need it. So if you have a micro four thirds camera, you really have to figure out what kind of lens will look wide angle on your camera, what kind of lens will look standard and what kind of lens will look telephoto. And you just have to do the math, crop sensor of two, you know, or if you get a Canon camera, do a crop sensor 1.6, or if you have another camera that has a, a crop sensor, then you can do 1.5 crop factor. And you just multiply it, figure out what lens millimeter lens number you need to get the ones that you want, the looks that you want. Telephoto lenses have a shallower depth of field and they have a lot more bokeh. Wide angle lenses have deeper depth of field and less bokeh. So that combined with the aperture opened all the way up, you can get a, a lot of blur in the background and it can be very, very shallow depth of field where I was talking about if you had like a 200 millimeter lens and you're just trying to get an extreme close up on somebody's eyes, you really got to be precise with that um, 
focus because if it goes out of focus at all, it's going to be really noticeable because it's an extreme close up. Um, and it might be such a crazy shallow depth of field that even the person's nose is out of focus, even though it's right next to their eyes. It just depends on, on how um, telephoto or how what the focal length is on your lens and how wide open the aperture is to get that shallow depth of field. And that's why with the uh, variable apertures, like with the zoom lenses, you also want to be aware of, of what kind of crop sensor you have <clears throat> and how wide open they can get because that'll make it less blurry in the background as you zoom in if it's variable aperture. So if you start at 25 millimeters on your lens and you zoom into 70 and you're losing the background blurriness as you zoom in, it's going to be pretty noticeable. So you want to, there's are, there are some lenses. I think most of the zoom lenses now have a constant aperture, but you just want to be sure and aware of what you're getting if you're going to get a zoom lens, because some of them do have that variable aperture that's going to change as you zoom in or out. One good thing about zoom lenses is you can have multiple focal lengths with one lens without needing more or having to change it. And some come with like a locking mechanism to where you can set it to 35 millimeters and then lock it there so it doesn't move in or out of the focal length that you have it at. So you can use it kind of like a prime lens. And you don't, and it also helps so that you don't need to change your lens out. So if you're if you're needing a bunch of different shots and you need them really quickly, sometimes a zoom lens will work better for it because you can get the 24 millimeter lens look and then you can zoom in a bit to 35 or something and lock it in place and get that look and then you can zoom it in more and, and do that over and over without having to change the lens out over and over again. Whereas with like a prime lens you would need two or three different lenses to make up for the one zoom lens and you also have to change out the lenses each time you want a different focal length. Zoom lenses do have more pieces in them though. So they do have a higher chance of something going wrong or coming out of place with them if bumped or dropped especially. So that is also something to consider. And zoom lenses typically tend to be more expensive than primes. But if you compare buying three different lenses, prime lenses to one zoom, um, it's probably cheaper to get the zoom. It just depends on what you're going for. Um, another thing to think about is what's called mount, lens mounts. So your type of camera is going to have a different kind of lens mounts than others. Um, Canon has a bunch of their own, like even in the same brand, you're not going to be able to interchange lenses if you have a bunch of their same, of different cameras from that one brand. Canon itself has um, EF lenses, EFS lenses, EFM and RF lenses. So even in that one brand, they have four different kinds of lens mounts. And with different manufacturers, different camera types, Sony, Panasonic, Canon, Nikon, they all have their own kind of um, mounting system where you can't just interchange all the lenses unless you get an adapter. And adapters don't work with every single one of them. There are lens adapters which allow your adapter to, so you can put the, the uh, camera to fit different lenses on it, but they don't work with every camera and they don't work with every lens. Especially if you have a lens that has any kind of electronic functions like autofocus or stabilization within the lens itself, you have to get it, uh, an adapter that is what's called a smart adapter that allows those electronic informations to be passed through to the to the camera. If you don't and you get what's called a dumb adapter, then it's just going to allow you to attach the lens, but then it's going to turn into a manual one. 
when we're talking about filmmaking, usually we want to have manual control over the focus and the aperture and things like that. So we don't really want as much of the electronic stuff. We don't want as much of the autofocus and things like that. Um, but you know, stabilization and things like that. And some some cameras are starting to have really good autofocus where I've seen some filmmakers are starting to use it for certain scenes where they're not really moving the camera too much because they the camera sometimes can automatically do it better than a human can. It just depends on you know what the scene is, how much movement there is, and what you want in focus. But certain things work a lot better. YouTubers especially will use autofocus and things like that because they're pretty much if it's just them talking to the camera, they wanna make sure everything they point to the camera or everything that they're saying is in focus. So they just set up a camera, put it on autofocus, sit down and, and then let the camera do its thing. But with filmmaking, with making shorts, movies, things like that, you typically wanna have manual control over almost all the elements. So it's not as important for that. Like I said, uh, lenses also, some of them will have that, what's called image stabilization built into them, which can help smooth out any shaky movement for a better, more stabilized look. So that maybe also be something you might wanna consider when, when getting one, <clears throat> depending on what you're using it for. And then, like I said, they can have autofocus capabilities. Not every lens is going to have those functions. Some lenses are only gonna be manual and manual means you have to physically turn them to get them to focus. So if you're just trying to get something that's gonna automatically focus on what you pointed at, you need to get a lens that specifically does that because not all of them do. With this uh, picture on the screen, this is a, if you buy, if you plan to buy filters, like ND filters, polarizer filters, things like that for your lenses, you wanna get the diameter of your largest lens. So the diameter is the, the top of the lens, the part where you take the lens cap off um, and the part that's exposed to the elements, not the part that goes into the camera, the other side, where, you know, if we're looking at this picture, it's the part on top. So you wanna, if you have a set of lenses, one of your lenses is going to have a larger diameter than the others. It's gonna be a bigger opening. And so what a lot of people will do when they're trying to get filters, instead of buying one filter for each of these lenses, because that's a lot more expensive, what they'll do is they'll buy a filter for their largest diameter lens. And then they'll buy these things like you see above each of these lenses, they're called step up rings, which means that now that um, this filter that's made for these larger diameters, it can be used on these smaller lenses. And so now you can use the same filter on all three lenses and it'll work properly if uh, you brought the right size for your, for your lens. If you buy a bunch of them, it can look like this and then you can kind of connect it. It might look a little weird coming off your camera, but it allows you to use one filter with every single lens that you own as long as you have the, the step up ring for it. When you're buying lenses, obviously something to consider is materials and the quality that it's made out of. Some are made out of cheap plastic and cheaper glass and the internal parts are cheaper to get it manufactured at a cheaper price. Those are more likely to break and they're less likely to get as good of an image or to be as durable if dropped or you know, just with use over time start to degrade quality. So. Look into that, you know, metal is obviously better than plastic and hard plastics better than the little cheap. You can tell between like more, if you touch more expensive plastic and you touch the cheaper plastic, you can tell the difference because it just has different feel to it. It doesn't feel like it's gonna break apart as easily. So that's something to look into when you're talking about lenses. Another thing you want when you're talking about a manual lens um, is with those, So we see these lenses right here and you have those rings, those focus rings. You actually want them to be a lot larger and smoother whenever you're talking about manual focus 
on things. So when you're talking about filmmaking, the reason why we use such huge lenses is because we want those, well, one reason is for more light, one reason is for more, um, <clears throat> the image it looks a little different compared to you know smaller lenses, but another reason is we want that larger focus ring so that it takes longer to get from one uh, from one plane of focus to another. And that will have it be look smoother, more professional. And if you're trying to rack focus from one thing to another, <clears throat> the worst thing you can do is over correct yourself, go beyond the point that you want to focus on and then have to dial it back. That looks very unprofessional and ugly. And so the quicker that ring goes from one focus plane to another, the harder it is to get those precise focus points, which is why you want something that's a bit larger and takes a bit longer to get from one focal plane to the next because it, it just has a bit more of a precision to it and less, less room for error compared to if it's really quick and you accidentally go too far it's kind of like if anyone's ever played a shooter and you put the sensitivity up way too high, barely touch the joystick, and now the, the gun points in the whole opposite direction of the guy you're trying to shoot at. Now you have to overcorrect, look back over to the side and try to shoot him, but you're probably dead by that point compared to having it a bit slower where you, you can still quickly look at him, but it's going to be a little bit more of a smooth movement where you won't go past him and you'll have a better chance of killing. Same thing with lenses. You want to make sure that the focus, you, you go directly to the focus and you stop when it's in focus and don't go past it and then have to come back because it just doesn't look good. <clears throat> we discussed in a previous semester, I think it was with cinematography, we talked about anamorphic lenses and what they are. So I'm not going to go into too much detail with them, but Anamorphic lenses are used when you want to get a super wide shot while maintaining the bokeh, unlike you can with a super wide spherical lenses or something like a, like a fisheye lens. So the difference is the anamorphic lens and spherical lenses. Spherical lenses is what you're going to find the majority of. Most lenses made are spherical. Most people like spherical. Anamorphic is a certain type that has a super wide angle of view, has a super wide aspect ratio. So you have to set up your scene in a different way when using them because it's going to show a lot on each side. Anamorphics are typically more costly than spherical lenses. They aren't as sharp. They have more lens flares. So if you guys have seen the Star Trek or anything made by J.J. Abrams, he loves lens flares. And he's probably using anamorphic lenses to get a bunch of those because light just reflects off them more than it would on a spherical lens just from the way they're made. And usually anamorphic lenses aren't as fast. So they can't open their aperture up as wide as spherical lenses can, or at least not on the same like price point or the uh, uh, price, or whatever you call it, price area. Anamorphics also, like we discussed previously, um, well, actually, so this 2.39 by one and this 2.35 by one. So you see the little red lines and you see the little blue lines. Those are the aspect ratios that an anamorphic lens will produce. So it's very wide. It's a lot more wide than the 16 by nine that we can do with spherical lenses, the four by three that's used for standard television back in the day and things like that. It's a lot, a lot wider. What an anamorphic lens does is it squeezes the image down horizontally so that it can fit on the sensor or it can fit, what it used to do is it used to fit it directly onto film, like a film stock. So it had to squeeze the image down. And then in post-production, it is de-squeezed and stretched out. Same thing still happens today. It's just digital now. 
So it'll squeeze it together, put it on the sensor, and then in post you de-squeeze it so it doesn't look all crunched and weird like it does on the left. It becomes a problem when you're trying to review the footage. You have to make sure that if you're using a monitor, you have to de-squeeze the footage when you're reviewing it. To make sure you're seeing what it's going to look like after you're done de-squeezing it, not what you're recording. Because what you're recording is this weird squeezed image so you can get that huge wide angle. So like that's what it would look like squeezed into the sensor and then you unsqueeze it later to get that. It also adds a bunch of side room. So you have to know, you know like it's gonna be really wide on the side. So there's, if you want stuff going on or if you don't, it's gonna make the character a lot more, um, it's gonna make the frame a lot more empty if there's nothing else but the one thing. So it's, it looks a little more lonely maybe. And if you have other things, if you have a bunch of people, anamorphic lenses will allow you to have a bunch of people in the same frame because it'll capture so much stuff horizontally from side to side. But typically, unless you really want to go anamorphic, unless you know why you want it and you're going to be having to you know, set up for it because it does take a different framing and a different production design to get it to work correctly the way it should. Unless you really want it, you really know what you're getting yourself into, just go with spherical lenses. Most lenses are gonna be spherical anyway. So if you're just buying them commercially, if you're buying them on Amazon, if you're buying them from b &H Photo or any of those other places, you're not really gonna run into anamorphic lenses unless you're looking for it. So almost all lenses you get they're already gonna be spherical and you don't really have to worry about it. But if you do want anamorphic, they are out there and they do have a huge or really wide aspect ratio where they're gonna have those black bars on top and bottom when shown on a screen. And uh, so it just depends on if you want that or not. But for the most part, just stick with spherical unless you, unless you do want anamorphic. So when you're using lenses, so I talked about like you can use lenses on certain cameras and then you can use adapters to have those lenses work on other cameras, other brands. <clears throat> so if you had a, a lens for a Canon camera, for instance, but then you just bought a, a Sony camera, they have the same sensor size, then you can buy an adapter maybe that would work with the lens and a new camera you got. And it could have that lens that you've worked, that you've used on your Canon camera and it might work fine. A problem comes in when you are trying to use an adapter on a camera to fit a lens that was made for a smaller sensor size. So if a lens was made for a micro four thirds camera and you're trying to use it on a crop sensor or you're trying to use it on a full frame sensor, what you're gonna get is lens, um, I think it's called vignetting, and it just makes the outside of the lens look a little darker, a little black. The degree to which this happens depends on how, what size that uh, lens was supposed to be made for. If it was supposed to be made for a micro four thirds camera and you are using it with an adapter for a full frame camera, you might get something like this where it's completely black and it looks like a sniper or something like that because it isn't made to have to, to capture the entire lens that uh, the full frame is, is uh, showing, the full sensor size anyway. Whereas if you use it maybe on like a, if, it's, if it was a lens made for a micro four thirds sensor and you're using it on a crop sensor, which is you know, the 1.5, so it's a little bit, it's not as a crazy of a jump. It might look something more like this, where it just has a bit of a darker edges around it, which is something you still don't want, but it isn't as bad as this. You know, this is completely like not usable unless you zoom in to the image. So you can't really go um, with adapters. You can't really use lenses that were made for smaller sensor sizes and use them on larger sensor sized cameras because it's going to start introducing these, these problems.
The other way around is um, if you're trying to use a lens that was used for a larger sensor sized camera, like if, you, if the lens was made for a full frame camera with, with the full frame in mind anyway, and you're using it on a crop sensor camera or a micro four thirds camera, you can use these things called speed boosters, which are adapters that allow for an additional stop of light for the lens to appear to be faster. So like it appears like the aperture can open wider than it actually can. And they allow for larger sensor sizes to be used on smaller sensor sized cameras. They are quite expensive, but there is that is an option. And it will give you more clarity and detail typically because um, that lens was made for a larger sensor and you're using it on a smaller one. So it just looks a bit better, but um, it's debatable and it just depends on your preferences and and it's not like a hundred, it's, it's, a, it's subjective, that's what I mean. But that is an option, getting a speed booster or an adapter that can work larger sensor sized lenses onto smaller sensor sized cameras uh, can work if you, if you really want to do that. When you're buying lenses or you're testing them out, if you're going into an actual shop to get them, you'll typically be able to test them out and you wanna see what the distortion, if there's any, you'll use something like this, which is like a lens test card or something like that, where you will set it up certain distance away from the camera, shoot the camera at it, <clears throat> video or, or uh, taking pictures, whatever you're trying to use it for. And then you'll review the footage and make sure that there are, there's no distortion, discoloration or, any weird like sh shaping or vignetting of the edges. Typically it, lenses will look pretty good in the middle for the most part, but when you get near the edges of the frame, they start to have different coloration or they have different shapes. They start to bend a little bit possibly. So you really wanna see if that's something that you are okay with. And that's why you use these tests when you were trying to buy a lens, you, you make sure that uh, you know what its issues are and if you still want it or not, or if you're going to go with a different one. But there are many different cards like this if you want to buy them for yourself at home. So you can test a lens if you buy it, if you're going to return it, if you buy them online, you can also do something like that. <clears throat> and different ones will have different things like this one has the colors on the side so you can see if they look as vibrant. Um, or not, and it has the color wheel in the middle, and then it has the little focus rings on the outside. So you see if the camera focuses on each corner in the frame, or if the edges of the frame, the lens starts to get discolored, or if it starts to shape those circles in a weird way, or starts to have that banding issue where those things kind of morph together. That's the kind of thing you're trying to see when you're, when you're using these, how much detail it maintains, and how much detail it kind of takes away or how colored it gets on any part of the frame, any part of the lens. With lenses, there's a lot of brands out there. Some of the main ones that you might hear are Zeiss, I think it's Anjanu, Anjano, Canon, Nikon, Sony, Fujifilm, Olympus, Panasonic, Panavision, Sigma, Tamron, and Rokinon. Those are all different brands that you might come across. I think Zeiss and, An and Angino, Angino, however you say it. I think those two are like the main ones for top tier lenses. And then you have the more commercial ones with Canon, Nikon, Sony, Fujifilm, things like that. Um, but it really just depends. And there's, there's different quality to different kinds of lenses within each of these brands as well. Like I said, Canon has their own four different mounts and that's because they have different cameras. Some are mirrorless full frame cameras, some are DSLRs, some are their cinema cameras. And so they're making lenses for each of those specific uses. Um, and so they have different quality and different costs there's like you know some of their top tier uh lenses are like 
in the tens of thousands of dollars, while the lower end and the more consumer grade end is, is somewhere within like 100 to a thousand dollars. And then, you know, the cheapest with the, when you buy a camera, some of these lenses might come with your camera and a kit. Those could be somewhere between 20 to a hundred dollars. It just really depends. There's a huge different range of lenses and quality out there, especially just within one brand. So you can imagine within multiple brands, um, how many different kinds of lenses there are. So you really have to do your research, but those are some things to look out for when you're, when you're going to buy one. Um, just be aware of all of those different things, especially that sensor size of your camera with the crop factor. Just so you know what the, what the actual framing is going to look like when you get that lens and whether you wanna get a prime lens or a set of prime lenses, or if you wanna get one or two zoom lenses so that you can do multiple things with them in one and just know what the pros and cons are of each. Anyone have any questions or anything to add to, to lenses? Did you mention, um, you had mentioned scratches on the used lenses and stuff Did you go over, uh, was it hair, like follicles of hair or dust and stuff like that? I think you did. I went over dust. I don't think I went over hair though, but that is another good thing. Hair can also get in the lens. And again, you'll notice it. It'll be like a little blur, a little blur line. Um, but yeah, I went over dust like, but, um, like that, those little spots. When you buy um, used lenses, they... Uh, not all, not all companies are, are, are big about it or stores, I say, are big about it, but you have to pay attention to those things in the description. Um, but there's, there's actually this store I, I found, I'm not necessarily sure where it is, but it's, what is it? Um, MPB is a really cool store that has, a, their whole niche is, all they do is they sell used products, like lenses, um, camera gear lenses anything like they sell a whole bunch of used stuff but i guess they're like a more upscale um you know they sell more you know like they test out their products yeah it's it's lightly you know lightly worn uh lightly used lightly worn stuff and they'll buy it from you and sell it to somebody else at a re uh, reduced price which nice. is I'm I'm very like picky about buying used, but I just so happen to buy this lens from them, and they shipped it to me. But the the cool thing I thought was pretty cool was they they repackaged it like in their own packaging. So it came in this, it came in a box and it came wrapped up and it was all fresh and sealed like it was brand new, and it had that you know that new scent to it. Like I was like oh. <laughs> you know, yeah. nice. that kind of that kind of takes it you know to a whole nother level in my opinion but i thought that was pretty cool like but um so there are a couple places like that that um sell used products this is the first one i've experienced but i'm i'm sure there's others that go through the same extent of selling used products lenses too um but i did the reason why i went with this one in particular because i was looking there's um there's B and H, and then there's uh, what's the other one? Um, Adorama or whatever that other one is. Oh yeah, that's yeah. They they sell for like they sell the same thing. And, um, but I went with this one just because of this. The description on the lens was a lot more in detail, but it didn't have it didn't have. I was kind of upset, but it didn't. They don't. I guess because they're new, they there wasn't like any uh, actual photos of the product. I can see it. Ooh, but, I'd be scared. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be scared about using it out pictures for real. Yeah, the price was a couple hundred dollars cheaper. And then um I was looking at B and H and I was looking at their photos, but they were using stock photos of it. It it was kind of like the same thing. I was like, well, that you know, I said it's, they're all the same lens, but you know, this one doesn't have pictures, but this one does have pictures, but those pictures are our stock photo, they're, they're not pictures of the actual lens. So I can actually see, you know, if there's a scratch on it or anything like that. Right. When they say light cosmetic wear, what does that mean? You know? <laughs> yeah. um, 
but this site, like I went with it because it was like, it was like, a, like several hundred dollars cheaper one. And then on top of that, like it was, the description was like, okay, like I, okay, I, I'll try it out. And if I don't like, it wasn't, it wasn't that expensive, but it was just like, I'll try it out. And then when they when they came to me, I was like, oh, OK, I see what their their whole niche was, because, you know, it was kind of shady new company. I didn't know. But I'm pretty sure, like, soon they're going to start adding photos and stuff like that to their to their roster. But I thought that was pretty cool. Um, yeah, that's awesome. So there is there is hope when it comes to buying used products and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. As long as they, the company starts doing their research and like doesn't just sell anything that they get. And yeah, you get the, that's where like the brand loyalty will start coming in. Even though it's not like their brand, it's just their company will actually sell product that is good quality instead of just some scratched up piece of crap that's not going to work. <laughs> what was it called? M MPB or MBP? MPB. Okay, cool. I'll write that down. Thanks. All right, so um, like I said, I'll email everyone out a the uh, color grading exercise that we'll have. And the other thing I'm gonna mention is for Monday, we are gonna be going over how to edit different genres. If there's any extra information in here that we haven't gone over before in this semester, we'll talk about it. Um, it's pretty much, I'm sure a lot of it's just going to be about timing, you know, making sure that the, if you're editing a fight scene, you're going to edit it before you see that they're not actually fighting. You know, you're going to cut it together quick with quick shots, drama, you're going to slow it down and stay on certain images for longer than you might in something else. Comedy, a lot about timing it, how long to stay on a shot, when to go over to another person when to show a reaction compared to the person speaking, horror, how much to keep out. We'll talk about all that. We'll see if there's anything new. Um, computer and editing equipment. So this is if you're going to buy a computer specifically for editing. We talked about monitors and everything already, but we're going to talk about the computer side and what you might want to look for when, when you either, if you're going with a Mac or a PC, pros and cons of each what to do if you're trying to build your own PC for editing, stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, hard drives, speeds, stuff like that, and what you need, what a RAID system is. We'll talk about all that stuff on, uh, on Monday. All right. Well, thank you, guys. Hope everyone has a good night. Good night, everyone. See you on Monday. <laughs>